This part of the symposium is going to be focusing on breast cancer. Uh, so we're going to have a forced detour of breast cancer for the rest of the day. But before that, uh, we're going to uh, have the keynote speech. Um, and I'm going to be introducing the moderator of the keynote speaker. And he is Dr. Uh, David Tuveson. He's a cancer center director at Cold Spring Harbor. He's also a professor of medicine. Uh, his CV is beyond uh, this two minutes of introduction. He's one of the cancer experts in the United States and maybe around the world. Uh, his training has been spectacular, uh, ranging from, you know, MIT. Anytime I go to Boston, I want to go to MIT and just take a look at the buildings. All right, so, uh, you know, starting from MIT to Johns Hopkins to back to Brigham, and it's just unbelievable, you know, spectacular training um, that he went through. Uh, he's a medical oncologist as well, plus a science part of it, uh, PhD. So he's just the full package of the clinician, the typical clinician scientist. Uh, he's made so many contributions to, uh, to cancer uh, and cancer genomics, especially in pancreatic cancer. Um, so I'm not surprised that he's directing the entire program at Cold Spring Harbor. Uh, so please uh, join me in welcoming him. Uh, he's my partner in this symposium. He's the co-director of the symposium between Downstead and Cold Spring Harbor. So uh, please join me in welcoming him to introduce the uh, keynote speaker. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Amoro. That was overly generous. Um, and thank you to you and to Laura for really doing uh, the lion's share of organizing this symposium. It's the eighth one, which is a uh, Terrific uh, accomplishment. So um, we're all very pleased that uh, Professor John Carpton uh, accepted our invitation to be our keynote speaker this year. Uh, Dr. Carpton is a world-renowned uh, geneticist, um, studies uh, familial uh, causes of cancer, um, and has made you know, seminal observations in a variety of cancers. So he um, went to Lane College, I learned yesterday, in the Mississippi Delta, and uh, from there to Ohio State uh, for his uh, graduate work. He's still recovering from a very bitter loss in college football, um, but but it's two months out, so he's probably fine by now. I was uh, I grew up in Ann Arbor, so I'm used to losing. <laughs> um, and uh, so so John, after he did his uh, his PhD work at Ohio State, did a, a postdoc with Francis Collins one of the um, most impactful and influential geneticists of, you know, of our generation. And after his uh, work um, at the NIH, John uh, worked at TGen um, in uh, Arizona and then was hired in 2015 to go to USC where he is the Associate Director for Basic Science in their Cancer Center. As I said, uh, John's worked on links to cancer in different populations, particularly ancestral links. And so he has identified polymorphisms and uh, alleles, which are causal in multiple myeloma, breast cancer, prostate cancer, the list goes on and on. And to, uh, we were lucky yesterday to have him uh, speak at Cold Spring Harbor to be our Roy J. Zuckerberg uh, speaker. And so we really got to spend much of the last day with John learning from him. He not only makes discoveries in his own lab and helps his cancer center uh, do well at USC. He contributes a lot at the national stage. He's the chair of the NCAB, which is a very influential advisory board um, to our government on anything involving uh, cancer. And he has a lot of ideas that he wished he had enough time to work on himself, but he just sort of shares his ideas so that other people can uh, run with them, which is really the sign of a scholar. So we're really excited to uh, hear from John today. He's going to give us a different talk than last night because he he likes to keep everything fresh for himself. Also, this is going to be very sciencey, he tells me. And um, it's about uh, cancer genome heterogeneity, and so we're looking forward to this. So let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Carpenter. Well, first, of course, thanking the organizers um, <clears throat> for the opportunity to uh, travel out from California to New York and uh, spend a couple of days uh, at some of the amazing uh, institutions out here and to hear about some of the great things that are um, underway uh, here in New York. And I think it's actually colder in California than it is in New York. And, you know, in February, March, that's just unbelievable. <clears throat> so uh, as, for one of the few times I said I was happy to get out of California um, with the, the rain and, and, and snow. Uh, and so 
I, I got a ch had the opportunity last night to present to some of the um, uh, faculty members and students and trainees and um, and other um, uh, individuals at Cold Spring Harbor last night, which was awesome. And that talk was very sort of high level sort of discussion on cancer health equity. Um, and I tried to touch on different aspects of cancer health equity that sort of span the the, the, the continuum of factors, you know, including so, uh, structural racism, socioeconomic the built environment, uh, uh, as well as some of the biological factors that might influence some of the differences that we see. But um, I want to talk about science today. I'm sorry, I'm just in the mood. I woke up this morning and I just want to talk about science, so forgive me. Um, I'm, you know, you'll, you'll get some of those concepts from Karen and from Melissa and some of the other speakers this afternoon, but I'm just going to ram science down your, your throats today. I'm, I'm just in the mood, right? I like to glaze, see people's eyes glaze over. Um, I'm just kind of in that, in that mood today. So, uh, and, and also brag on some of the work of, of, some, of some of the trainees that have uh, come through our program and our laboratory. And so this overarching concept of heterogeneity, right? And, and thinking about it from two different angles, population heterogeneity, differences in the population, right? We're, we're, we're all different. Um, uh, and, uh, and then the cancers themselves, right? When you look at a cancer, right? It's not, it's not just one group of cells that are all identical. It's, a, it's a, an amalgamation of different uh, cells and features. And so, um, you know, this whole concept of the impact of, of heterogeneity and, uh, how the limited understanding of both population and cancer tumor heterogeneity can blur right, the import, some of the important insights into cancer development and progression, preventing our understanding of the broader and fuller context of cancer. Again, limiting optimal and most effective approaches for management for all people. I think over the last 15 or 20 years, it's been amazing to see the advances and, the, 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 and it's been really encouraging to see so many people getting into this field. Um, and, but what I caution people is that we're not just trying to look for differences. Of course, the differences are important and that is part of what we're doing, but by learning, right, by studying diverse populations, that information helps everybody, right? And so that's what we're really trying to get at here. And so I'm gonna first start off with some of the concepts around population heterogeneity and how that can feed into some of the bio biology that we're studying. And then I'm gonna walk through what I think is a really cool vignette on tumor heterogeneity, how the tumor cells are different. Uh, and when you study a diverse population, you might actually find differences uh, um, uh, in the tumors and the way the tumors grow uh, in individuals across different uh, racial and ethnic groups. Um, so the, the American Cancer Society every year puts out um, a document called Cancer Facts and Figures. I don't know if you've ever looked at that, but it is an incredible resource. Um, this guy, Jamal, he has done this for decades, and it is one of the most incredible, he's my hero. It's one of the most incredible documents. It's so full of information, and uh, I think oh, maybe over the last eight eight or nine years, they actually started putting out facts and figures for African Americans and for Hispanic Latinos. So they have the overall, and then they have facts and figures for different ethnic, uh, racial and ethnic groups. And, and within, for instance, the, the African American facts and figures, they include a table like this, uh, where they, uh, uh, to, where they um, uh, develop what's called a rate ratio. So it's just looking at the rates of a cancer type, and for instance here, in blacks versus whites. Right? And then they create this rate ratio. Um, and the higher that ratio, the more significant the difference in the disparity is. And so here we can see uh, um, uh, when we think about incidence rates, so prevalence of cancer in these two racial groups, we see Kaposi sarcoma in black men and women being the most significant disparity, which is an age-related malignancy. And then when we get beyond Kaposi's, we see diseases like multiple myeloma, gastric cancer, uh, various forms of liver cancer that have significant differences in the prevalence of those cancers in blacks compared to whites. And they do the same thing for death rates or mortality rates. And here you can see for uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, black uh, men, we can see stomach cancer, gastric cancer, prostate cancer. We've all heard about the issues with prostate cancer, larynx and multiple myeloma. And then here uh, uh, for females, uh, gastric cancer, myeloma, cervical cancer, and endometrial or uterine cancer, right? Predominating and being uh, uh, much more, uh, um, uh, um, uh, and not, not only much more prevalent, but actually 
actually um, causing a significant increased burden in terms of death rates uh, when we look across these populations. And what we also know, and I think you're going to hear again a lot about this in some of the uh, subsequent upcoming talks, so I'm just going to touch on it here, but I know Melissa and, uh, uh, and, and Karen and others will dig a lot deeper into this whole concept where we tend to put these factors into two broad categories, right? We can think about the social or societal uh, uh, factors that would influence these, could influence these disparities, the social determinants of health, of health right, SDOH, right, the, 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 the socioeconomics, access to care, uh, financial toxicities, and things of that nature, right, that, that probably uh, are the root cause and the foundation of a lot of disparities, whether they're disparities in incidence, uh, but primarily disparities in outcomes. Uh, and so the so social aspect of race Race, right, race as a social construct, not a biological construct, but a social construct, versus the biology or the biological and the genetic as we think about our underlying genetic ancestry, right? Each one of us is an ancestor of individuals, right, in our, uh, in our, uh, our past and we're the descendants, right? And so genetic framework has been passed down to us right, um, over, over many, many generations. And in many cases, they fall into root genetic ancestries that are associated with specific geographic regions. Uh, for instance, many African-Americans, Afro-Caribbeans, Afro, uh, Afro you know, we're, we're descendants, right, in some cases, in many cases, of, of individuals who, right, were brought through the transatlantic slave trade. Right? So a lot of our ad genetic ancestry comes from sub-Saharan West Africa. When you think about Hispanic Latinos, we think about Amer American Indians, right? So this whole concept of our underlying genetic ancestry. Again, Melissa's going to probably dive really, really deep into this. She's got some beautiful work on associating various concepts around genetic ancestry and uh, cancer disparities and, and breast cancer. But these things also probably don't work in a vacuum, right? They're not independent. They probably work together, right? We think about, you know, for instance, an African-American community. I grew up in the Mississippi Delta, right? One side of the tracks, all black people, right? And, and of course, we're impacted by the same built environment. So we share our underlying genetic ancestry, but we also share our environmental ex exposures, our social stressors, right? And so these things aren't acting independently. They're probably uh, uh, um, uh, acting in concert to impact uh, the host and the tumor biology in a way that could likely uh, um, uh, allow a cancer to manifest uh, and grow and perhaps be more aggressive and, and harder to uh, manage and treat. So there's been significant historical focus on, again, the role of social factors, socioeconomics that influence disparities, right? I'm not going to talk about that today because what we've, and there's been a ton of work in that area, right, foundational, and we know that these issues impact cancer disparities. But where we've really lacked, right, is a lag behind is trying to understand any possible role for biology, whether it's a disparity in, in disease prevalence or incidence or risk of cancer, or outcomes, right? How people do after they're treated and managed, right? Uh, and so by exploring the role of biological differences in tumors across populations, it could help to broaden our understanding of the complexities of cancer uh, uh, in a way that uh, best approach disease management more effectively. And so there have been a number of large studies. Um, Nick, Nicholas talked about, um, uh, gave us some, you know, introductory comments about the polyethnic 1000, uh, but there have been other studies, large studies that have generated, you know, tons of data, right, biological data, and looking at tumors, right, and saying, what is the, what's the makeup of these tumors? Right, and in this one study, the TCGA, the Cancer Genome Atlas, they profiled tumors from, I think, 11, 12,000 people, right? But what we found out when the study was done, only about nine or 10% of the tumors came from underrepresented minority patients, right? So did we really understand the broad and full complexity of cancer when the vast majority of patients came from one racial and ethnic group, right? Probably not, and I think there's mounting evidence showing that that's the case. A number of studies, um, I'm gonna pick on Yasha, she's out here in the audience. Her and uh, her colleagues and uh, Tim Rebick and others have published several papers on that big data set where they took all of the patients and they actually did, uh, uh, deduced their genetic ancestral proportions, right? And they also have the self-identified race information. And then they looked at the biology of the tumors and then began to ask questions, do we see differences 
based on the patient's race and ethnicity or genetic ancestry, and they actually did find differences. Right, so this is part of that evidence. And some of the cancers, they saw certain genes that had higher frequency of mutations in tumors derived from blacks. Uh, in some cases, they saw uh, um, uh, uh, mutations in genes that had lower observed frequencies in tumors derived from blacks. So we're, there's mounting evidence, a number of studies. I mean, and these aren't studies in, in you know, the journal of irreproducible data, right? These are, these are studies in major high impact scientific journals in multiple tumor types prostate cancer, breast cancer, multiple myeloma, colorectal cancer, uh, um, uh, leukemia, pediatric leukemia, showing that when you look at the genetics and the biology of these tumors and you have enough patients from different racial and ethnic groups, we actually are finding differences. But again, the, the, then, the, then the next question is, right, what's the relevance of those differences? Right, and a lot of work is being done to tease those things out, and some of the uh, investigators and individuals in the room are at the forefront of, of, of uh, teasing out those um, uh, important biological contexts that might be associated with the differences that we're seeing. So I'm gonna shift gears a little bit now, and some of, the con uh, uh, some of what I just talked about will find its way back into this, this tumor heterogeneity uh, um, uh, component of my talk. So as I mentioned, when we think about cancer, right, especially solid cancers, right, that grow in our body, right, they typ there's typically a cell that, tran that becomes transformed. Now, there could be a lot of different things to influence that transformation from a cell being a normal cell to a cell becoming a cancer cell. But one of the features of a lot of cancers is that that cell takes on a feature to grow faster. And so now it's, its machinery, right, has to work a little bit differently. And what happens typically is that it can't fix errors as, as, as well as our normal cells. So what happens is you start off with a primordial cancer cell that expands, and then another, one of its daughter cells acquires another mutation, and it becomes its own clone, right? And other cells, other daughter cells might acquire different mutations, and they become their own clone. So what we end up with is a tumor that has cells that were derived from one primordial cell, but all of these cells will have, a little, have some differences. And what's important there is that sometimes a difference, a difference will occur that will make those cells behave differently, like making a cell want to move and get out of the, the tumor mass and spread and go somewhere else in the body. Right? Or it may acquire mutations and changes that make it resistant to different types of therapies like chemotherapies. Right? So we need to identify all of these, variable, all these various and variable cell types within the tumor to identify those that are likely the real bad actors. Right? And then we can understand what's causing those cells to be the bad actors and perhaps that can really help us uh, uh, better understand how to manage these diseases. This was very elegantly shown uh, in, in real time by Charlie Swanton and his colleagues uh, over in the UK, where they took a, a renal tumor and they, they went in with a razor blade and they cut out different parts of it. And then they profiled each piece separately. And they also had two metastatic lesions, cancers that had spread away from the, the kidney and were in the chest wall. And he looked at the mutations in those as well. And he wanted to compare, right, all of these different regions of the primary renal cancer to the metastatic lesions and were able to show that one of those regions, only cells from one of those regions, this region R4, shared mutations with the metastatic lesions, suggesting that the cells that gave rise that spread, right, came from this one area of the tumor. So imagine if we had done a standard molecular profiling approach where we just took the whole tumor, just, just shredded it up and just sequenced it all together, we may not have seen those mutations, right? Because they may have been present at such a low level, we didn't have a, a they, they would fall below our limit of detection to identify those mutations, right? And so this was, and they were able to build out a phylogenetic uh, uh, phylo tree of how that, the primordial clone probably arose and then how the different clones right, uh, manifested in that particular tumor all the way out to the metastatic lesions and they were able to show the same thing at the gene expression level. The other thing that's important about these tumors or these tumors that get cut out and removed, right, is that it's not just cancer cells, right? The tumor is growing in the context of an organ or other tissues, 
right? And so there's this mixture of various cancer cells and various normal cells, or I'll say non-cancer cells, like the fibroblasts, the stromal cells, uh, the vasculature, right? All of the, 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 blood, the blood vessels, right? They're feeding the tumor oxygen and, 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 and nutrients to grow, right? And uh, uh, more importantly, the immune cells, right? The immunological response against the tumor, right? And so you have this, this sort of, you know, amalgamation of various cell types, Right? And so when we use these technologies sometimes where we just take the tumor again, we crush it up, and we sequence all of the, 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 the analyte together, right? we're, we're looking at this, this mixture, right? we have, whether it's DNA or RNA, we're looking at a mixture of these molecules. Right? And then we have to try to average out right, what we think is going on in each of the different cells. But we now have technologies that will let us take a tissue separate the cells apart, and sequence each individual cell. And then we can use computational approaches to find cells that have similar features that sort of, where their data clusters together, and it would suggest that those cells have similar biological features. They could be different types of immune cells, normal cells, uh, or different types of cancer cells. Now, as powerful as this technology is, and it's kind of revolutionized our ability to look at cancers, right, and understand that heterogeneity, the different cell types. When we crush the tumor up into single cells, we lose the spatial context, right? Because there's some in important aspects of how cells grow together or grow apart from each other in the actual tumor. And so now we have these new technologies that allow us to do single cell or near single cell analysis, but we do it on the microscope slide. So we can now see, we can look at the various uh, alterations in the cancers, but be able to see how the cells are organized together in the tumor. And so today I'm gonna share a vignette of some work that we're doing to, uh, and, uh, where we developed a study designed to assess tumor heterogeneity uh, to look at this tumor and immune microenvironment. I'm gonna use that term, the microenvironment, the tumor, um, using the, these, these uh, new uh, spatial technologies. And we did it in a diverse cohort of patients, right? We, just, we didn't do it in, in a bunch of tumors from white people. Sorry, I'm gonna say it, right? We actually, because we wanted to begin to ask, 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 ask and answer questions about what are the similarities and differences, right, when we look at the tumor microenvironment from cancers derived from black versus white patients. And the example is triple negative breast cancer, so I think it's great that it's sort of it's going to segue into our, our next, um, uh, uh, our next uh, session. So TNBC or triple negative, triple negative breast cancers are the ones that don't express the estrogen receptor, the progesterone receptor, or the HER2 receptor. These are molecules that are on the outside of breast cells, right, and, and breast cancer cells specifically. And there are targeted therapies against those three proteins, those three molecules. So women who are diagnosed with hormone receptor positive, there's a drug, tamoxifen, and it targets Right, those hormone receptors and those women typically will respond. For HER2, there's a great um, HER2 poster out there on Afro-Caribbean women. There's a drug called trastuzumab that targets that molecule. But there's another group of breast cancers, about 15 to 20 percent, that don't have those markers. So there's no, there's no therapy for these women. Right? It's, it's pretty nasty chemo. Right? Um, uh, it, that's, their, that's their only option. Right? Um, these cancers tend to grow more aggressively, they spread faster, uh, they tend to come back after the chemo treatment. Um, and interestingly, even though it's about, it represents about 15% of breast cancers as a whole, it could represent up to 40% of breast cancers that are diagnosed in young premenopausal black women. And the rates might be even higher when we go to Sub-Saharan West Africa, and I think Melissa's going to talk about uh, uh, some of those disparities as well, and the connection between, uh, as we think of, as we look at triple negative breast cancer in women from Africa versus women here in the U.S. And so it's possible that this triple negative subtype might be associated with the increased death rates that we see in breast cancer uh, uh, among black women. And so there have been a number of studies. I mentioned this TCGA, right, and they profiled four or 500 breast tumors. Again, this was one of the tumor types where they actually did okay. Um, I think they had 14 or 15% black 
tumors from black patients in that study, um, which is about as good as it's gonna get. It might be a little bit higher than that. Um, but the one thing that they found that we typically see with triple negatives are mutations in this one gene called P53. 80% of, outside of that, when we look at the genome, there's not a whole lot there that, that's targetable, right? That we're, now it was a great talk this morning, uh, the pancreatic, the Burke 5 I'm really interested in to see if they, they're gonna run some of those studies uh, in triple negative breast cancer. But right now there's no defined targeted therapies for women diagnosed with this disease that's enriched among our young black women, right? And so we need a more research into this area to uh, develop um, um, uh, better approaches. And again, a lot of these studies were of the bulk type, where you just take the tumor, you shred it up, and you, you just analyze, and you're trying to, again, you're averaging out what's there. You're not able to look at the specific data from each specific cell type. And so we set out to interrogate the tumor microenvironment of triple negative breast cancers and a diverse sample of, of, of cases and using this, this unbiased, spatially resolved uh, molecular approach. Another part is, is, is the diversity of the, the investigative team. So this study was actually led by a series of underrepresented minority trainees, uh, Rania Bassiuni, who's a postdoc of mine, Lee Gibbs, who's a postdoc of mine, and Michelle Webb, who's a PhD student with David Craig, who's uh, um, of uh, Latino and, and Amer Indian uh, uh, um, uh, uh, ancestry. And then my, my partner and collaborator, Michael Idowu, who's the head of pathology at VCU Massey Cancer Center. Right? So a very diverse group of investigators setting out on this really novel, innovative study to better understand the uh, um, uh, microenvironment of triple negative breast cancers. And so here's just some, some of the demographic and basic information on our patients. We had 16 total tumors from 16 patients, eight Af self-identified as African-American, eight that self-identified as white. We had to remove two of the tumors. One of them was more necrotic, where all the, the cells were dead and a, 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 one of the other tumors was more lymphoid, so we wanted to get rid of those two. So we, <clears throat> our, our analysis was basically on tumors from seven black women, tumors from sec, uh, seven white women. And the another thing that we did was we took random sections. We didn't want to go in and say, we want to find regions that have a lot of tumor cells, or we want to find, we, it was a very random approach to just cut the sample, place it on the microscope slide. And we took two different pieces from each tumor Right? So we, we analyzed two different areas of each patient's tumor. So that gave us a total of 28 samples to interrogate across these 14 patients. Another important thing is that only a few of these patients received neoadjuvant, neoadjuvant therapy. That means that they would have gotten chemo first to try to kill off some of the cancer and then surgery. The problem with that is that if the cells have seen this chemo, they could be different by the time the cancer comes out. So most of these were what we call treatment naive, right? So the cancers came out before the cells got to see any kind of drug or therapy. Oh, and the, the other important thing about this is most of these were relatively early stage. And this is a really unique aspect of our study. Most of the studies, particularly in triple negative breast cancer, are done in high grade uh, tumors. The tumors are stage, high grade, high stage. These were early stage, and this was really important for us because we're trying to see what's going on in these tumors before they get a chance to really take off and, 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 and go rogue, right? Maybe some of the things that we find in these early cancers will shed light on what really causes uh, these, these tumors to, to be bad, particularly in young, in young black women. I don't want to spend too much time uh, uh, on this, um, other than you know we use these special microscope slides. Um, we take tissue, we p place them on these slides, and then uh, this is the unique aspect. We're building up these sequencing libraries off the microscope slide, and each each one of those fragments actually has a molecular zip code. So when we generate data from that piece of of, of RNA, we know exactly where it mapped on the microscope slide. So when we overlay that on the tissue. We can see which cells, right, that data came from, right? And when we begin to look at the different types of cells, we can generate these clusters and we can see the different types of cells based on their molecular states, where they are and how they're uh, uh, interacting with each other and whether or not there are patterns. Again, I don't want to spend too much time here on the, the but, you know, we have really good resolution here at uh, 55 microns per feature. There are about 5,000 of those features in each one of these regions. Uh, so we're able to really get high resolution. So we're probably, each one of those features, we're generating data on probably two to 10 cells. 
So it's not single cell, but it's pretty, it's getting pretty close to that, that level of resolution. These are just some of the sequencing statistics, which shows that it was a really, really successful experiment. We generated high quality data that we could then take into our analysis. Then we're able to use these uh, bioinformatics tools. Many of these tools were prepared to use the kind of uh, analysis I was talking about earlier, where you just take the tumor and you just shred it up and right, and, and you're trying to average things out. But here, because we're almost at single cell resolution, we're using these tools and we're getting high quality information on the likely cell type that we're profiling across the microscope slide. And so we use these tools to determine if we have a, a cluster or a group of cells, are these likely tumor cells? Are they likely normal cells? Or are they likely immune cells based on their transcriptional states or molecular states? And so the first thing uh, Ryan Lee did was to just look at each section independently. And we were able to take, uh, for instance, what's called an H&E section that the pathologists uh, 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 create for us. And um, essentially, they can go in and take a pen and mark and say, this is all cancer. And this is all fibrosis. Right? You can see the dark is the cancer and the light color is just fibrosis. And then we can, then once we perform our spatial transcriptomic analysis, we convert these into these, uh, um, these pixelated, this pixelated image, where we can then begin to ask questions about the, the molecular feature of the cells that are associated with these different features, right? And say, are these likely tumor cells, stromal cells, or immune cells, right? And so you can't do this based on the current approaches. You can, you can use tools that will try to proportion out that information, but here we can actually see it, right? And live and, 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 and in color. Um, and we can actually uh, use these tools and get really close and almost draw the exact same type of image that the pathologist can draw. Can, can. We're not gonna replace the pathologist, right? And we're hoping to bring them into this. I know sometimes they see this stuff and they, you know, we need our pathologists. Um, uh, but this is, this is allowing us to see things at a, a very different level of resolution. I talked about the tumor heterogeneity, how all the tumor cells aren't the same. This is a really interesting example of that. So we have this region that has high tumor purity, this, these regions in red. Right? And remember, I showed you, this is the fibrosis. And you can see that those genes, those, th these are not tumor cells. Right? Now, when we look at the clusters, if you look at this region, there's a green, a purple, and a yellow. And it means that there's three different types of tumor cells growing in that region. Right? And the interesting uh, observation was that this cluster six, the purple cluster, um, actually is enriched for genes associated with a process called hypoxia. And hypoxia is, is where cells can grow with almost no oxygen. Now, these are cancer cells, but they're able to grow, right, and feed themselves, right, without access to the vasculature. So they're not getting oxygen. They're making their own nutrients by eating the molecules inside themselves, right? And so the interesting thing about these cells is that they're growing away from the blood vessels, which means they likely won't, be, won't have the same access to, for instance, a chemo, because the chemo is going to come through the blood vessels. And the immune cells come through the blood vessels. So they're away from the blood, cell, blood vessels and the immune cells as well. So this is a really amazing observation. And the interesting thing is when we look at bulk RNA-seq data, we really don't see this pattern because it's buried in the data, right? And so we're really excited about these observations. I'm gonna come back to that. So we can do really amazing uh, um, uh, analyses and identify marker genes associated with the different clusters. Um, and again, map them back and show how different marker genes and pathways and processes are, are um, um, uh, uh, expressed in different populations of cells uh, on each tissue slide. We can also do really cool stuff looking at the immunological sort of uh, um, uh, um, a framework of these cancers. And so here, looking at the region that has a high immune score, suggesting that here's where we see immune cells populating this particular tumor bed, and we can also validate that using um, uh, gene sets associated with inflammatory responses. Um, and Dave brought up something earlier in the one of the, asked the question of, to one of the pancreatic, uh, during one of the pancreatic presentations about tertiary lymphoid structures. Right? And so in this particular 
uh, sample, the pathologist came back and said, okay, this is tumor, there's some fibrosis in here, but this looks like what I'm gonna call a dense lymphoid infiltrate. Just a region with a lot of immune cells. And we could use estimate again to show that there was a really high immune score in this particular region and a low tumor purity score. So there's this, real, this bed of immune cells, right, that are growing inside of this tumor. And when we, when we dig deeper um, into, this, into this region, we can then begin to ask questions. What does this really like, look like? What's the structure of this, of this feature? And Dave, again, introduced this concept of the ter tertiary lymphoid structure. And these are like little lymph nodes that are start starting to form inside of the tumor. And it's supposed to be associated with favorable outcome, meaning if a tumor has more tertiary lymphoid structures, those tumors tend to do better because there's like a, an immune response that's readily available, right, to, to attack the tumor cells. And they, these uh, uh, TLS have a very specific structure. So you typically have a bed of, of uh, B lymphocytes that are surround, that's surrounding a set of T lymphocytes. And so we can begin to ask the question, if we look at that dense lymphoid aggregate in the sample, what does it look like? Well, lo and behold, that's exactly what we saw. We could see a ring of T cells around a, a group of dendritic cells and B cells. So we can actually very accurately identify these tertiary lymphoid structures. And here's a smaller one uh, 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 towards the top of this particular image. You see the T cells, the dendritic cells, and the B cells. So we're now using AI-based approaches, uh, uh, computational approaches, to be able to tease out tertiary lymphoid structures from these types of data. So Rania then went rogue on me and said, I want to do something different. So originally she was looking at each tissue section independently. She said, I want to take all of the data from all 28 samples, normalize the, 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 the data, and then generate clusters and see how they map back to each of the individual samples, right? So this, this, this integrated analysis that she decided to do. So we had about 38, 39,000 total features across these 28 samples, and this is how the UMAP broke out. So we were able to identify nine integrated clusters uh, from that analysis. The, and what, what was another striking result is that we found features from every cluster in every section which would suggest that there is a conserved cellular architecture in triple negative breast cancers, right, across, across racial groups, which was uh, one of our exciting discoveries. We could then use the same tool, estimate, and ask, if we look at cluster one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, are these likely tumor cells, stromal cells, or immune cells? And we can see, for instance, clusters one, two, five, and nine, have high tumor purity scores and likely represent uh, uh, various types of tumor cells. We have our stromal clusters and our immune clusters. We can then take that data and, and identify marker genes that are associated with each of those nine clusters, and then also begin to ask the question, what are the molecular pathways, right, that are associated with each group of tumor cells uh, uh, based on the clustering analysis? And I'm going to point to cluster five because that's going to come back later. <clears throat> and it's that cluster that's associated with hypoxia. We can then take this data and then map that back spatially. Again, this is based on the integrated analysis, and we can then begin to see where is the high expression of certain marker genes that are associated with these uh, nine clusters. Uh, uh, I, IGKC, which is an immunological marker, and we can see that it's, it's highly expressed in this region of stroma and immune uh, uh, fibrosis uh, uh, in this particular section. NDRG1, which is associated with hypoxia, which we can see that's enriched in this region of the tumor bed and in this, in this section and in this section. So we can then begin to identify marker genes and ask questions about what's the spatial distribution of these various cell types uh, uh, across each tumor. Now this is where she really went off the, off the rails. So she came into my office one day and knocked on the door and said, I'm, John, this is all cool, but this is spatial genomics, right? Spatial, why aren't we doing anything spatial? Right? I said, well, we are, you know, look at your, you know, your, 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 your spatial map. She's like, no, what about the spatial relationships of cells? Are there certain cells that have dependencies that want to be close together? Or certain cell types that want to be far away from each other, right? 
And so she um, 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 uh, applied this, this technology or this, this informatics approach called the joint count statistic. And this was created for geospatial uh, uh, mapping. So this is like taking a, a satellite image of the rainforest and saying, whenever we see this tree, we see this shrub, right? They, and always, no matter where we look, we always see them wanting to be together. Right? Conversely, every time we see this type of tree, right, we never see water, right? meaning that that tree can probably grow in a low water area. Right? So she said, why can't we do this with our data? And begin to ask questions, are there certain cell types that like to be together versus cell types that like to be away from each other? And so she was able to convert the spatial data and rasterize it and then utilize this uh, uh, computational approach to look for non-random relationships, right? So it's essentially like a bootstrap uh, approach that asks the question, do I, how often right, do I see this cluster or feature cell type next to this one and, and, and vice versa? How often do I always see them away from each other in a non-random way? and putting some statistics around it. And so we, we can look at these, um, these uh, uh, plots where you can see the dark boxes. This is the autocorrelation. So this is cluster one to one, two to two, three to three, four. So there's always gonna be high correlation when you do the, uh, an analysis like this. But what we're looking for is, is there a different cluster that has a high correlation? So in this instance, cluster four has a high correlation with cluster one. And we can see it when we look at cluster four and we look at cluster one, which would suggest that the cell types representative of cluster one like to be close to the cell types associated with cluster four. And so she then plotted this based on z-scores to make sure we had some statistics behind it uh, using some, some uh, 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 pretty stringent uh, z-scores and we could find these correlations where we could see, for instance, in these pairs, uh, um, uh, this correlation, uh, be the positive correlation between cells in cluster three and cells in cluster seven, right? And we can see it spatially. So when we look at clusters, uh, uh, um, uh, positive spatial dependencies for uh, uh, integrated cluster three and integrated cluster seven, when we look spatially, we always see the green and the yellow cells close to each other, right? And we can even see it in the UMAP, right? They, they, they have similar, more similar uh, um, uh, uh, spatial dependencies. And so finally, of course, for me, it's like, okay, Rania, you've done this amazing work. Now let's, let's see, are there differences when we look at women, uh, uh, tumors derived from black women versus white women? And so one of the first things that we were happy about was that we had almost an even distribution of features. We had about 19,000 features from tumors from blacks and about 19,000 features from tumors from white patients. And so what she did was she asked the question, if I look at the total number of features in each cluster for blacks and whites, do I see a difference? And lo and behold, two that jumped out at us, one was cluster five, where we see the significant enrichment of features from cluster five and tumors from black women compared to tumors from white women. And remember when I talked about cluster five, it's this cluster associated with hypoxia, right? These tumor cells that can grow without access to oxygen. Right? And they're probably growing away from the blood vessels. We also saw an increase in uh, features in cluster three in tumors from whites versus black. And this is an immune cluster. Right? So there's this interesting uh, uh, observation here. These really bad cancer cells, these hypoxic cells, are enriched in tumors from blacks. And the immunological cells right, tend to be enriched in tumors from white women. Again, these are early stage triple negative breast cancers. We, we took the, uh, uh, this, uh, again, a, a step farther and did the spatial analysis, and again, this is just a section that has a tumor with high tumor purity, high uh, uh, enrichment of hypoxia, and when we looked at all the features from the tumors from blacks and whites, we saw a significant increase in enrichment in these hypoxic tumor cells and tumors derived from uh, black women versus white women. We could also take this uh, 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 deeper on the immunological side and use a tool that was designed to take bulk RNA-seq data and try to determine the various proportions of immune cells in that sample, 
But again, we've got data on just a couple of cells, right? So we can have higher resolution and a better understanding of the likely immune cells that are within each feature. And uh, again, I mentioned uh, IC cluster three being this immunological cluster uh, that had the highest degree of immune cells, and we saw it uh, uh, more prevalently in tumors from whites. And so this is where the rubber kind of met the road, which is we've got these two clusters. We have an immune cluster, and we have this hypoxic cluster. And when we do the, did the joint count statistics, it had a negative correlation, meaning that when you saw immune cells, the hypoxic cells were growing away from, from the immune cells, right? So you can see the orange are the, is the uh, immune cluster, the green is the hypoxic clusters. And unlike I showed earlier with clusters three and seven where those cells were always close together, these cells always are far apart from each other, right? So could it be that in tumors from, from, uh, uh, that arise in black women, there's this propensity for cells to become hypoxic and grow away from the blood vessels and be able to grow without oxygen, and it pushes them away from the vasculature, so those cells are not as, as um, readily available to chemotherapies or, or a strong immune response. So we're really excited about these results. And then finally, we were able to get the um, survival data on our patients, and we were able to show that tumors that had high hypoxia marker, NDRG1, those patients had worse outcomes. And the patients that had high IgKC, which is this immunological marker, those patients did better. And she was able to validate that in an independent, publicly available data set of RNA sequencing data. And she was able to show a very similar correlations. High immune marker, better outcomes. High hypoxic marker, worse outcomes. And then she looked at the ratio. Tumors that had high hypoxia, low immune, and those women did uh, worse of all, right? And so this is kind of an interesting pattern that we're able to tease out using this particular technology that is, we probably weren't, wouldn't be able to tease this out using some of the more standard approaches um, for profiling tumors. So, so in summary, novel spatial transcriptomic technologies provide a new approach uh, for assessing and measuring tumor heterogeneity and uh, tumor immune microenvironment in cancers. Spatial transcriptomics has uh, revealed a conserved cellular composition and spatial architecture in triple negative breast cancers within this diverse cohort of patients. Uh, molecular annotation using these tools like uh, estimate and gene set enrichment can clarify the cell type structure and transcriptional states of cells within the triple negative breast cancer the tumor and immune microenvironment. This technology has identified tumor cell heterogeneity uh, and the existence of these uh, tertiary lymphoid structures in triple negative breast cancers. Also, the novel implementation of the joint count statistic uh, demonstrated specific cell type non-random proximity relationships. And for the first time, uh, this technology and our study revealed uh, that proportions of specific tumor and immune cell types are different in triple negative breast cancers derived from black uh, versus white women. And we're really uh, um, excited that Rania's paper got accepted to cancer research and it made the cover. So uh, really, really uh, amazing work by Rania and Lee and her team. And uh, uh, these are our funders. So thanks, everyone. I don't know if there's time for questions. I see Antonio's hand go up. First of all, cool. <laughs> this is, I'm sorry, this is, this is cool. It's I told cool. you I was just in a science <laughs> mood today, man. <laughs> it's cool. Um, yeah, so, yeah, this is really cool. So I'm just curious now, again, throwing the environment back in, you don't happen to know the, you don't happen to know, like, the, 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 the environment that these black women and these white women were in, because it, it just will help to add to the story of, of what's going on, but, but no matter what, this is cool, this is cool. Absolutely, so, you know, of course we're working on, on an R01 um, to get funding to expand the study to a larger group. Now we have marker genes that we can look at, so we don't have to do this now, right? We can just look at the marker genes um, in a large cohort of patients from the same area, uh, from the Virginia, Richmond area. Um, and uh, be able to possibly collect geocoding data to look at zip codes and map that to environmental exposures, 
um, uh, um, you know, poverty levels, right, of the women within that cohort, to begin to ask the question, are there environmental or social stressors and influences that are driving this hypoxic cellular phenotype and tumors derived from black women. Um, so, so stay tuned, and uh, that's, that's part of our, our validation study. <laughs> she throws up the hand. <laughs> I can hear you, Melissa. So I I'll guess try I to repeat go. your question. Yeah, uh, right up here. Oh, oh, oh back here, I'm sorry, sorry about that. Then I'll hand the microphone over to the next person. Um, you're, uh, the hypoxia was very interesting, and I was wondering if you sort of, uh, what went off in my head is angiogenesis in the tumor, tumor angiogenesis. Mm -hmm. And um, what subsequently went off is uh, VEGF. VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, is a very important component of angiogenesis. So, so have, you, have you looked at VEGF markers in your tumors as well or intend to? Yes, we have. And um, there's something interesting there for sure. Um, and so you definitely think about the vasculature, right? There's, there could be some really interesting about the vasculature. Now, what, what's causing that is probably more interesting as we think about the, the extracellular matrix, as we think about you know, high-density breast versus low-density low breast tissue, right? As, as well as obesity, as obesity, right? So these are some of the things that we're looking to correlate, but we're only gonna be able to do it when we have a larger a uh, 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 data set. So again, we can look at these markers now. Now that we've made this discovery using a more unbiased discovery-based approach, we can say, okay, here are the 50 markers, right, that we want to look at that can help us ask and answer those types of questions. So, so yes, there's definitely an angiogenic component to this. Um, I'm, I'm going to keep it short because I don't want to eat into my own time. But we can, think connect, we we can some, connect at any time. We have some correlating data. But one of the things I wanted to ask was, well, two. First of all, tri triple negative breast cancer subtypes. So yep. do you know yep. whether or not there was a bias in the subtypes of triple negative breast cancer? And then secondly, did you measure genetic ancestry? This first time that I realized that the cohort was from Virginia. Yep. So I was wondering, for your African Americans, do you have any information about their genetic background? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, the, the good thing about this particular study, this discovery study, we did get base level data, right? Um, so we are trying to figure out how to do the ancestry. It requires creating these, um, um, you know, aggregated BAM files, right? You, you're taking all the data from all the features, right? And then you're trying to call SNPs from that data, right? And um, so, so, so yes, we, we, we are definitely, you know, doing that. And, you know, it's a small, it's a small data set, right? It's seven and seven. So, you know, and then um, your, your first question was um, tri triple negative subtypes. We actually, were you a reviewer? No, because <laughs> one of the reviewers, one of the reviewers asked that question. And so Rania had to go back and the Vanderbilt site was down, right? And that was one of the things that held us getting a paper in because she was trying to come up with a way to, to do the triple negative breast cancer subtyping from the data, but she was actually able to do it. And what we found was that in any given tumor, they can be multiple cell, cell subtypes. So you can see mesenchymal and basal-like in the same tumor. Yeah, do you know anything about the, any, temporal uh, formation of those, those patterns? Uh, and are they different in either different subtypes of breast cancer or different uh, ancestry groups? Yeah, the temporal, uh, you, know, we've, you know, we've really focused on the triple negative breast cancer, so we haven't looked at any other subtypes. Um, I don't know if I want to, uh, to be honest. I think it's important to have some focus. Um, and so we'll continue to focus in that area. Um, so there's the temporal aspect. I would love to do the longitudinal studies, right, where we have tumors from treatment-naive women and then follow those women over time. And if the cancer comes back, right, get another biopsy and see how the microenvironment changed. Um, and whether or not, for instance, in the relapse tumors, do we see an, uh, an even greater enrichment of hypoxia right, in those tumors. So those are the types of studies that we want to do. That's really hard to do, um, to be able to get that kind of material, but uh, I think it's, it's definitely something we want to, want to try to attempt. Hello, thank you for your presentation. It was, it was amazing. Uh, I do have a question. So the, the observation that 
the increase in highly hypoxic cells uh, is uh, negative, negatively correlated with the uh, with the increase in immune cells is quite logical, right? Because if you have a highly hypoxic environment, the immune cells cannot infiltrate. Right. So actually, it's the one thing that leads to another. So my question is, did you think about examining the expression profile of these hypoxic cells? Because I guess that would be the key, to see why some cells are, are so much predisposed in specific population groups to be highly hypoxic, and that would lead to uh, in the immune system not being able to, to get them, to, to do anything with them. So. Yeah. No, no, it's a great question. Thank you. Um, essentially asking, or, or, or first stating, right, that you have the hypoxic cells and they tend to be distanced away from the immune cells. And so the question is why, right? I think one is just physicality, meaning the hypoxic cells are growing away from the vasculature. Right, so the, the immune cells are coming out of the vasculature, right? So they're gonna have a harder time getting there. But what's interesting is there's this, it almost, it's almost like a barrier of sorts. So one can begin to ask the question, are, are the hypoxic cells emitting some type of cytokine signal, right, that's also preventing, right, an infiltration of the immune effector cells into that area of the tumor that right, uh, uh, com as comprised of hypoxic cells. So some, those are some of the downstream things that we're trying to explore, um, looking at the, 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 the uh, cytokine profiles, right? That's where I would start. So this is on, okay. Uh, yeah, about the hypoxia again. Um, <laughs> you know, when you, when you can't deliver oxygen uh, from a vascular system that I believe in, in tumors, if you agree with this or not, is, is sort of messed up. It's not a very good system, it's leaky and the like. So if, you yeah. if you're not getting oxygen in and you want to deliver chemotherapeutics via the vascular system, you can sort of assume that maybe your chemotherapeutics are not getting into the tumor as well. Yeah, yeah I fair? mentioned that. Yeah, I okay, mentioned yeah. that. Sorry, I came late. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I mentioned but, that. But then, so does that, does that bear out clinically that, in other words, uh, you know, breast tumors and black women are a little bit more recalcitrant to chemotherapeutics as opposed to absolutely you're finding oh okay absolutely so, yeah absolutely higher rates of relapse right higher rates of of uh, uh chemotherapeutic resistance all of that right and so could this play a role at least in part will this be the answer to every difference we see in triple negative no right but it's an interesting freaking clue Right, and it might play a role in some patients. So if we can, when we think about the concept of precision medicine, right? So can we use markers associated with hypoxia to identify a group of women, right, where we know chemo is not likely to work, right? And can we come up with improved approaches? And maybe these women might be more um, uh, um, uh, responsive to radiation therapy, right? That's another thing that... <laughs> Exactly. So instead of those women going on chemo, where we know it's likely not to be as effective, maybe they go on chemo and radiation, right? Wouldn't that be awesome? That would be awesome. <laughs> so, thanks, everyone. I want to thank John for a provocative talk. Thanks, really great. And our final session will be chaired by and led off by uh, Dr. Melissa Davis. She's a um, uh, a force in the field of uh, genetics of breast cancer in, in diverse populations, and uh, she has actually spent a lot of her research um, looking at the genetic causes of, of breast cancer in Africans and in African Americans as compared to uh, Caucasians. Um, she recently moved from Weill Cornell to Morehouse, and she's ca frequently called on by some of us in this room and many of us in our community for help you know, in this field. And so we're really pleased that uh, she came back to be with us today in New York for this important symposium. Thank you, Melissa. Um, while we're getting set up, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Um, really excited about this session, and I'm gonna get around to uh, introducing some really dynamic partners on my panel. Um, also, I just wanted to say I got my PhD at uh, the University of Georgia. And um, as Dave just mentioned, um, John got his PhD at Ohio State. And he just came off a huge loss. And well, go dogs. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> uh, we're 
already? Okay. Um, so resolving race versus ancestry and breast cancer disparity. So first of all, John is really hard to follow, but he actually set me up pretty well. Um, these are my obligatory disclosures. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the rationale because I think you guys have probably heard a lot of that today, and I want to get to my science as well. But we certainly want to um, acknowledge the fact, as John mentioned, that there are multiple factors that lead to this disparate outcome um, of mortality differences in all diseases generally. And I think that it is important that we recognize we need to work together to find that intersection of why we see differences. Um, I had the pleasure of giving my predictions of what will be the hot topics in 2023 around cancer disparities research. And I'm going to talk about a couple of them today, one of which is oncologic anthropology, which is a term that was um, it came to be from Dr. Lisa Newman, who's my research partner and chief of breast cancer, of breast surgery at Newark Presbyterian Hospitals. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about ancestry-related genomic diversity um, within our cohort, which is from the International Center for the Study of Breast Cancer Subtypes. So again, this is just the outline of what I'm going to talk to you about. I'm going to skip through that because I want to get to the, to the good stuff. Um, so here's the problem, breast cancer mortality rate um, is 40% higher for African Americans than white um, Americans in the United States. Um, but that wasn't always the case. So here what I'm showing you is a map of the sort of um, percent of poverty county by county in the United States. The more red the county, the more high the poverty rate. If I were to also show you a map of where our African American population is also most dense, you would see that it correlates especially around the Black Belt region of the United States, which is, which is that area around the southeast. But if you look at the, at the mortality rates for both prostate and breast cancer, um, from actually the publication that John mentioned, is also now taking a look at where patients live, so whether they lived in poor or affluent counties. And so if this was really only about socioeconomic status or social determinants, then we should see some resolution where black patients who live in affluent counties and don't suffer the same barriers wouldn't have the same level of mortality, and that's not necessarily what we see. In fact, affluent black patients still have a higher mortality rate compared to white patients who live in poverty, because we don't necessarily have a monopoly on poverty. Um, also, what we recognize here is that breast cancer disparities didn't even exist prior to the early 1990s. It didn't matter if you were black or white, poor or affluent, you had the same opportunity to survive. We started to see the emergence of disparities based on um, advent of some of the targeted therapies that John mentioned, which is for endocrine um, receptors, ER, HER2, um, targeted therapies became standard of care. And so we see this stark decline in the mortality rate in white women that does not necessarily get reflected in the black population until much later, and we still see this persistent disparity. So this is our why we're studying this. So I really got into this sort of distinction of tumor biology during my postdoc at the University of Chicago, where I worked with Dr. Fumi Olopade and Sarah Gellert, who were co-leaders of then a very innovative concept of interdisciplinary cancer disparities, um, so they had an institute there. One of the things that we wanted to see is within our U Chicago healthcare system if we also saw this disparity, because of course in a, in a singular healthcare system, all the patients should be treated with equity, standard of care. But we did see what the nation saw, which is that at five years there was a 30% survival disparity. However, when we stratified for whether or not patients had ER positive or ER negative tumors, we saw that the patients with ER positive tumors didn't necessarily show that same disparity. But in the ER negative category, we saw an even broader um, disparity. So this now gives us this indication that there are different types of breast cancer. On the worst end of that spectrum, worst prognosis is triple negative. So that's a, a, a portion of the ER negative tumors that we saw in um, UChicago. And as John mentioned, triple negative breast cancer has a higher prevalence in black women earlier onset which is also an indication that there may be a genetic component. So in a similar study, now I'm showing you about 20 years worth of data where with Dr. Newman, we looked at our Henry Ford Health Systems cohort, um, as well as our New York Presbyterian cohort, and we simply wanted to know of the patients who had triple negative breast cancer, could first of all screening be an indicator of difference in survival rates, but also just generally whether or not white and black women had the same health outcomes within, again, these same healthcare systems. 
First of all, we didn't see any difference in whether or not the tumors were screen detected. Screen detected simply means that the tumor is so small the patient didn't know that they had a mass. It was identified through mammography. Usually that's very early stage cancer. It's easy to cure. Um, so we didn't necessarily see a disparity there, which is something we could discuss later. And then we also didn't see any difference in the stages here. So when we look at screen detected versus not screen detected, again, because screen detected is earlier stage, we see that there is sort of this higher likelihood of survival if it's a screen detected cancer, which represents, is represented by the blue line. But when we separated for white versus black patients, again, we see this very stark difference in screen detected and non-screen detected only in black patients. And so that's interesting. Why would we see a lower survival for the non-screen detected in black women specifically compared to the white women? Now, there could be any number of reasons for this, but paramount among that could be the biological differences and therefore the way treatment is actually um, working in these patients. And so um, most of my career, my adult career um, as a faculty, I've been trying to determine these race group differences. So the earliest work that we did, we didn't necessarily have information about genetic ancestry. This was around the HapMap project for those of you who've been following human genetics. So before the thousand genomes data was available, I worked with um, individuals at historically black colleges like Renee Reams at FAMU, uh, Clayton Yates at Tuskegee University. You know, these were the investigators who early on before it became well-funded um, try to identify what is it about our particular communities that produces these more aggressive um, phenotypes of, of tumors. One of the first things that we discovered with Dr. Yates's group is that African Americans also have a higher prevalence within triple negative breast cancer of a quadruple negative tumor type, which is represented by an additional receptor called androgen receptor. Turns out that quadruple negative breast cancer is actually even more aggressive than triple negative breast cancer. It's an even earlier onset, um, and we showed that in one of our first publications. Now, we've gone on to even show that race group differences in triple negative and quadruple negative breast cancer, um, we can identify um, different signaling pathways that are differential in these tumor biologies. Even some epigenetic mechanisms are distinct between race groups. In, in one of our papers, we showed that microRNAs um, had a distinct race distribution within the tumors. We could even use this subset of microRNAs to predict race in a separate cohort. That's how very distinct the expression patterns are. And again, these are in the tumors. Some of these microRNAs actually regulate the path of canonical cancer um, um, signaling mechanisms, such as MYC. And so um, as we look even deeper, one of the things we find is that one of these um, African-American specific quadruple negative breast cancer microRNAs only has clinical significance in the African-American population. And so we have this sort of conundrum at the time that we were identifying things that were specific to a minoritized group and that's not necessarily, at that time, something of interest, if you will, to the mainstream of, 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 of our cancer um, field. And so as we look at any way that you can define a phenotype, whether it's the PAM50, which is one of the um, first um, uses of genomic uh, data to qualify or, or categorize uh, breast cancer subtypes. We see a difference in that distribution between African Americans and white Americans. And then, of course, we also see a difference in the types of triple negative breast cancer between these race groups. And so, again, as John pointed out, there are population level differences in the tumor biology. And so we took painstakingly um, meticulous efforts to use all the data we could find in the general population in the, in the, in the, um, in the public domain, I should say. Now, um, if there is a genetic driver, some of the classical methodologies we would have used in order to identify that would have been what Marie Claire Klink King, for instance, utilized to identify the BRCA gene, which is to show the transmission of a molecular marker through a large family. 
right? So anyone in the family who has the disease has passed on some type of genetic predisposition. But we don't necessarily have that ability in the black population because of our experiences here in the United States. We don't have this type of information. Now GWAS, or genome-wide association studies, should have saved us because in these studies we don't need related pedigrees. We just have a large number of people with the disease and we're comparing a large number of people who don't have it. And then when we see um, a bias in a distribution of a mutation, then we basically attribute it to that phenotype. But unfortunately, we have a sampling bias problem with GWAS studies, which is that the majority of the information came from European populations. And so we really don't have a good picture of what the distribution of any risk allele is outside of European ancestry groups. And this is the data that shows that, which is simply that the majority, over 98% of the genomic data uh, comes from or is derived from the European ancestry group, despite that group not being the majority of the global population. The largest uh, genetic ancestry group is only represented by like 1% of the data. This translates into clinic by the fact that our genomic panels and cancer gene panels give us unactionable results. Um, we have a larger um, likelihood of having a variant of unknown significance identified on a mutation panel if you're of any other ancestry group. And so we take this global oncology approach now to actually identify whether or not, if it is something genetic, does it stem from our shared genetic ancestry. So if we look across the globe at the rate of triple negative breast cancer, we find that the highest rates are in sub-Saharan Africa. And in fact, in any country where we can separate self-reported ancestry, whether that's African Americans in the U.S. or black South Africans, it is that component of the population that has the highest rate of triple negative breast cancer. So we treat this as a very unique population, the African diaspora, as John Rep, um, um, alluded to, from the transatlantic slave trade. This is very unique because most populations, as we define them, are the result of founder populations where a migration event occurred, where a group of people moved from one region to another. Unlike the transatlantic slave trade, where over hundreds of years, millions of Africans were displaced in a very distinct pattern. And so then we have this gene flow, continuous gene flow of African genomes across the globe. So in our uh, assessment of whether or not this is sort of a, dis a predisposition within this context of genetic ancestry, we measure genetic ancestry in our multi-ethnic cohort. We have sites in Africa, um, one site in the Caribbean, and of course in the United States. And we found repeatedly that the higher your West African ancestry, the more likely you are to have a triple negative breast cancer diagnosis, mm -hmm. other than other types of cancers. And we even look specifically just within African Americans um, to show this. So um, I won't have time to go into a lot of detail about many of our findings mm -hmm. from our cohort, but just to say that part of the Polyethnic 1000 project that Dr. Robin spoke about earlier uh, is underway. So this is just a snapshot of some things that are in progress. One of the things we want to determine is whether or not genetic ancestry correlates with any of the mutation signatures, those mutation signatures being um, associated with the types of mutation patterns that you see. So for instance, signature one here, represented in blue, is an aging signature. So just over time, there's a certain pattern of mutation types that accumulate over age. We also see that this particular mutation pattern happens in African Americans a bit earlier than other groups. You see that generally, not just in tumors, right? Um, signature three here is representative of brachiness. So whether or not patients have a BRCA mutation, typically they accumulate the signature three. And so there are some signatures here that we see enriched in our African and African Americans that don't necessarily have an etiology yet, but we see it very strongly associated with ancestry. And we have some clues as to what we think some of those um, uh, um, drivers of these mutation patterns might be. So invite me back next year and I'll be able to tell you specifically what those are. Uh, among them, so within Signature 3, some interesting findings is that we are actually seeing this sort of trimodal distribution of Signature 3 where it's either a large component or there's none of it there or there's like this group of individuals that have sort of this moderate Signature 3 that is also correlated um, with homologous recombination deficiency. 
Now, this particular marker is representative of a very specific type of mutation pattern that is also um, indicative of whether or not patients can be treated with other types of targeted therapies, such as PARP inhibitors. And I'm going to come back to that. So we did have a landmark paper in cancer discovery where we looked at African and African American triple negative breast cancer tumors, but defining their expression pattern. Now, before I tell you about that, I want to come back to the fact that we've done this over and over again, where we're looking at differential expression using RNA-seq to determine population differences in triple negative breast cancer. The first time we did this analysis, um, we did it based on race groups. And then we compared the differences if we categorized people by race versus if we categorized them by ancestry. And we saw different patterns even then. So in this particular analysis, what we did was instead of categorizing people by race, and even instead of putting them back into boxes based on some arbitrary cutoff of 20 or 30 percent admixture, we just used a linear model to determine whether or not genetic ancestry, specifically African is what we're focused on, could identify a subset of genes that are driven by genetic ancestry. And so today I'm going to focus on the African genes unapologetically, but we did find other associations even with European ancestry. So this is one of my favorite slides. It basically shows individual levels of, of genetic ancestry, similar to what Dr. Robin showed earlier. Right? But one of the striking things that came out of this analysis for me was that in each one of our African American patients, we saw every region of Africa represented in their genetic background. And these are African Americans from across the South, as well as New York and in Detroit. And so this indicates that the, that the African American community is a very diverse group of individuals. And even though we share a large component of Africanness, that origin of Africa can be very different. But of note from our cancer discovery paper, we found some really cool things that are actionable. First of all, some of the genes that came out of our network analysis was that we saw upregulation of APOE, PARP1, PDCD1, which is PD1, it's an exhaustion marker. We saw that we had um, an enrichment of immune cell migration, but a down regulation of immune cell activation that was associated with, um, with um, African ancestry. And of course, we were able to do our typical analysis of, of finding genes that are differentially expressed that are associated with genetic ancestry. And in the overlap, um, what we found was that these genes have the opposite expression polarity. So this indicates that these sets of genes have an ancestral specific marker that's driving the directionality of their expression. And it's such a stark contrast that it's literally up in people of African descent and down in people of European descent. And so part of our follow-up is to identify what those were. Now, similar to what Dr. Um, Carpton did, we used CyberSort to identify in our bulk sequence analysis the estimated amount of immune cells. And what we actually saw was that African ancestry was associated with more immune cell infiltration. Now, keep in mind, our Africans are from Ghana, Ethiopia, and African Americans. So this is a mixture of um, different genetic backgrounds. We showed that this was also prevalent if we looked at an independent cohort using traditional IHC markers, that our West African and African Americans had a higher infiltration of immune cells in their solid tumor mass. And then we, of course, validated this using specific markers, even on the transcriptional level. Now, we don't necessarily think that this is a new finding uh, from population level genetics. And in fact, what we know is that if we look at evolutionary studies that uh, um, people of European versus African descent can have immune cell infiltrates that behave differently, which would explain why, for instance, because I just told you that Africans and African Americans have a higher infiltration. Typically, that would mean a better outcome, but we don't see that. And in fact, when we look more carefully at the survival associated with tumor-associated leukocytes, when we compare African Americans and European Americans, African Americans do not have a benefit for that higher infiltrate. And so we think this is correlated with the tissue immune microenvironment of the tumors. We think it's related to a dysregulation of systemic inflammation. That dysregulation of systemic inflammation is associated with the Duffy null allele. Now, the Duffy null allele is fixed in sub-Saharan Africa because it conferred immunity to malaria. 
it normally would regulate the inflammation levels, but in people who are Duffy Null, we see chronically high levels of immune um, of, of inflammation. In fact, um, even though dark is expressed, so, so Duffy Null allele is a mutation in dark, we know that dark expression on the endothelial cells now is what is driving this higher infiltration of immune cells. Um, we showed in a previous publication that the more dark expression you have, the more likely you are to have this infiltration. And this is from the um, endothelial um, function of dark. But the systemic regulation of dark um, actually leads to chronic inflammation that we think creates a unique microenvironment. So we undertook single cell analysis. Here we're using imaging mass cytometry, which is different from the transcriptional profiling that Dr. Carpton has. And this is an antibody-based panel looking at protein markers. And so on our spatial analysis, what we saw was that in tumors that have higher amounts of dark, they also have higher amounts of vasculature. And that vasculature that is also expressing dark is what facilitates the immune infiltrate. In, in tumors that have low expression of dark, we don't see infiltration in the solid tumor, but isolation in the stromal compartment. When we isolate each one of those individual immune cells, for instance, CDA-positive T cells, what we also found was that our African-Americans T cells had this exhaustion marker. And so what does that mean? It means that specifically in people who are of African descent, you may have a higher amount of immune cells infiltrating into the tumor, but because of this ancestral informative marker, those immune cells are exhausted, and so they're not actually performing the duty that they should be. And so this leads us now to further characterize this dark immunophenotype, specifically wanting to know whether or not Duffy Null kind of alters the function, if you will, of what the microenvironment can be. And that's certainly what we're starting to find, which is that having a Duffy Null mutation means you're more likely to have this PD-1 signature. It also means that you're more likely to have a different subset of cells in your microenvironment. Even systemically, when we look at inflammation markers, we find that the Duffy Null um, um, genotype is associated with a higher amount of circulating um, pro-inflammatory chemokines that literally alter the function of immune cells, particularly one IL-1 beta, which is known to deactivate cytotoxic T cells. So in closing, um, all of that genetic ancestry and immune biology is leading us down a path that particularly people of African descent probably would have a better outcome if we allowed them to have access to immunotherapies. But even those genes that are associated with race indicate that there are components of this tumor biology that's associated with comorbidities like obesity and diabetes that is the consequence of the structural racism. So, Previously, one of the um, participants asked about um, social determinants, and we do believe that some of the social determinants are what we see embedded in this um, tumor biology. Tumor biology that could even become predictive markers if we start looking at the circulating uh, characteristics of these tumors in an ancestral uh, informative way. So I'm going to stop here and acknowledge my group um, at uh, Wild Cornell, of course, um, at New York Genome Center, um, and ICSBCS, and all of our international partners and participants. Okay. Thank you. And without further ado, I want to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Karen Winkfield, um, who has both her MD and PhD degrees. Um, from Boston University, I'm sorry, from Duke University. I know, right? I just put you in a different place altogether. Uh, she did her residency at Harvard. Um, she's the executive director of the Meharry Vanderbilt Alliance, um, Ingram, Prof Ingram Professor of Cancer Research and Director of Diversity and Inclusion in the Department of Radiology, Radiation Oncology at Vanderbilt and Professor of Medicine at Meharry Medical College. And today she's going to speak to us I'm sorry, about uh, advocating for breast cancer equity. Please come forward. So um, we're going to hold questions until the end.
Thank you so much, Melissa. And thank you so much for the, to the organizers. And thanks to you all for being here. Hopefully you're not too glazed over from that basic science talk, because we're about to have some fun. We, this is the fun session of the afternoon, just saying. Um, so the, the other thing, Dr. Carpenter, I just want to mention, hopefully you have a radiation oncologist on your team. There were two signatures that I saw in that heat map. G2 checkpoint, remember radiation induces G2 checkpoint, and also the fact that the hypoxia, and I tell my patients all the time, radiation doesn't have the same limitations that systemic medicine has, right? Because the x-rays actually go through and are not limited by vasculature. So I'm just saying, that's another thing that we can think about. So, all right. So, so let me just, let me, um, let me just start um, by, by saying I am a recovering basic scientist. Um, I actually was back in the lab doing a laser, um, laser capture microdissection to get those single cells. So I'm like amazed about how far we've come with technology in order to look at the single cell. Now this was back in the day when we didn't know what BRCA was. And I'm sitting there and trying to make a knockout. And I said, you know what, instead of that, I'm looking at all this literature and seeing that there is a signature saying that black women are dying of breast cancer at a much faster rate at a much higher level than any other racial or ethnic group. And I was like, well, why is that? And I wanted to look at the biologic basis of that. But here I was at this institution that was, you know, pretty good institution. And guess what happened when I went to go look for specimens and biospecimens to look at some genomic um, comparisons? There weren't enough black samples. So I was like, I don't understand this. This is a majority minority city. We had 34% blacks sitting there at the time. Why were there not black people walking through the door of that institution? And so while I am absolutely enthralled by all of the science here, I decided I was going to move more towards policy and community engagement. And the reason why is because I needed to understand why it was that the people who need care most were often excluded, not even thought about, not even brought to the table to have discussions. So in fact, I was very thrilled when, you see this picture? I took this picture. I was sitting next to John Carpenter. We were in the White House, four rows back from the president when he made the announcement about the moonshot. Right? Moonshot 2.0. And if you recall what he said, his goal was for us to change the face of cancer care as we know it. That the expectation was to reduce cancer mortality by 50% in 25 years. He also threw in a little bit of information about disparities. Why is that? Well, as you know, in order to make sure that we change the face of cancer care, we need to make sure that everyone has access. And that, frankly, is not the case. We heard one of our gentlemen talk about some of the fantastic therapies they have at MD Anderson, one of our speakers, et cetera, right? But, oh, but not for everybody, right? We've heard over and over again, people talk about the clinical trials that may be massive, but they have a small percentage of African Americans that are represented, blacks or Hispanics or whatever, under, underrepresented groups. We've got to do something different. The AACR, has decided to publish this series that actually outlays and talks about progress um, and how we're doing from cancer disparities. The good news is, as you see the trend lines there, we're doing better. We're curing cancers, people are living longer with cancer, but the mortality curves still suggest that there is a major gap between the outcomes for blacks, which is that top line there, and every other racial or ethnic group. So while disparities, and I'm going to talk broadly about disparities and talk about some of those social determinants, because again, I'm going to move a little bit away from the basic science, because all that basic science is great as long as people have access to it, right? So we have to think strategically about how we can improve cancer equity, and that requires every single person in this room and listening online to think about how you can engage in advocacy. That same report that AACR put out talked about the many factors that go into some of the disparities that we see, and certainly biology is one of them. But this whole chart is talking about some of the things those isms, racism, sexism, right? Like we can go through the isms that do have impact. And sometimes the impact certainly is on genetic expression. 
epigenetic modifications, right? How the DNA is expressed may change, in fact, based on your environment, based on those influences, those pressures that you experience. But we also know that there are just structural barriers to people walking through the door. So what are the ways that we can engage to change the face of medicine so we can change what those outcomes look like? This is indeed the social determinants of health. And look, people sometimes get caught up in the first half of this chart. I love this chart, this Kaiser Family Foundation, where people talk about economic stability, right? We can certainly think about uh, lack of employment or underemployment, right? We know that there are areas where transportation is a problem. We were talking just earlier, our folks in rural communities, it can sometimes take them a long time just to get to where cancer care is. When I was associate director of the Cancer Center in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, I had people driving 200, 300 miles, and we were the closest cancer center. What happens if their car breaks down? What, what happens if their son can't take off from work? Right? This, this is real. Education and literacy, and I tell you, this is not just about whether or not people can read, because frankly, that's a challenge. When I was in Boston, the functional illiteracy rate was 24%. 24%, that means, and this is like, and you know Boston, right? You have all these universities and colleges, one in four people walking around was functionally illiterate, meaning they could fake it. But then you hand them a brochure that says, here you go, here's how you access this care. Or, or here's what you need to take, how to take this medicine. And they go, uh-huh, and walk out the door and can't read what you give them. These are all the things that we have to think about. But let me tell you something, as a radiation oncologist, as an oncologist, as a healthcare provider, I know that it's also the healthcare system itself that's broken. When we still have states that refuse to pass Medicaid expansion, despite the fact that there is data to show that that Medicaid expansion, yes, Obamacare, has revolutionized access to screening, has reduced death rates for cancers for the states that have enacted it, what's the holdup? Well, it's interesting. I actually talked to a colleague of mine who said, well, did you notice which states they are? The majority of those states' population is majority black. That black belt, remember that Melissa was talking about? There are a few holdouts that are up in the Midwest area where it's a much lighter population. But I tell you, this is something that we've got to think about. So what are the things that we could do? How can we advocate? Well, it goes back to the concept of precision medicine. You remember, you know, Dr. Carpton talked about precision medicine. And I think a lot of times when people think precision medicine, they're talking about, oh, what's the target? What's the protein that we can, that we can target, right? What's, the, what's that gene that might be abrogated or changed that might have a pill that we can give somebody that's going to come after that disease and, and get rid of the disease? And that's great. I think that's an important thing, and we've got to keep making progress there. But today, I want us to think differently about what we call precision medicine. I want us to think about the social context that people find themselves in. I want us to think about all those things. You see the genomics. We heard about the genomics and the, and the microbiome, et cetera. But what about those exposures, the expososome that individuals and communities are faced with every single day? How does that impact their outcome? How does that impact their disease? These are all important things. And yes, biology is important, but you've got to think about how the community accesses care. Precision medicine must think about these communities that have been excluded over and over and over again. And while, of course, as a black woman, I have always focused my work on thinking about black populations, when I became cancer center director, associate director of the cancer center, I couldn't just focus on that one population, right? I had to have a much broader lens and say, well, what does this mean for other populations that have been systematically excluded? LGBTQ plus community, older adults being excluded from clinical trials, those same clinical trials that y'all want to talk about? Why is there an age limit? Or how about adolescent young adults, sometimes, oftentimes the most excluded community because they're making that transition between their parents' insurance and their own, right? And yet, we just heard that young black women have the highest risk for triple negative black can or breast cancer, right? They fit in that adolescent young adult. Adolescent young adult goes up to age 39. 
We've got to think differently about what we mean when we talk about advocacy and equity. The two go hand in hand. And I tell you, socioeconomic st status is important. And I know um, this is a, um, an opportunity for us to think differently. Again, socioeconomic status, income, occupation, education. But when we know, when we have data that shows that children who live in poverty are seven times more likely to have poor health, that's a problem, right? And this is not new. The Unnatural Causes documentary has been out, I think, since 97. And that's where we first learned that place matters, right? That, that geo code, that that street that you live on may in fact present an obstacle, may be more important than your own DNA in terms of determining what your outcome is, right? We learned that a long time ago. But it was interesting because when Melissa was talking about those overlay of maps, you overlay poverty, you can overlay food deserts, you can overlay cancer incidents, you can overlay HIV AIDS, right? That's not by mistake, that's by design. How many of y'all have heard about redlining before? Show of hands. Okay, good. Good number. This wasn't a policy that was sanctioned by the U.S. government to essentially create ghettos, places of poverty. And it most impacted blacks because it literally was based on the color of people's skin. Not being able to get loans for homes and kind of literally creating red lines on maps that says do not give loans to people who live in this area. So you're creating wealth gaps on purpose. You're creating those pockets on purpose. I bet you if you put the red lines on those maps that Melissa just showed, that Dr. Davis just showed, you would absolutely see the same areas. The poverty, the health disparities, it's by design, y'all. So what are you going to do? What can we do? Well, you know, my colleague and I, um, Dr. Wynn, we talked about how COVID in many ways opened people's eyes. <laughs> there were a lot of naysayers, because those of us, we've been doing this work for a long time, y'all. We've been doing this disparities work for a very, very long time, and it wasn't sexy back in the day. All of a sudden, with COVID and everything kind of coming up, people are like, oh, yeah, there are some differences. Mm -hmm, yeah, we knew, right? We've been talking about it for decades. It became sexy. But I think here's the, here's the deal. We now have to take what we learned and make application, do some implementation, do things differently. Because if we keep doing the same thing, what's going to happen? We're not going to make any progress. It's really hard, though, when the social determinants of health go outside of what's happening in term, inside of the medical care system, right? Again, I'm a physician, I'm a clinician, I see patients. And so if the medical care itself only accounts for a small 25, 20 to 25% of the care of population health. Then how do we kind of think and, and, and open up our minds and say, how can we be creative in terms of impacting the rest of the social determinants of health? This is the three A's, all right? I always want to leave you all with things that you personally can do. This is advocacy. This is how we get to equity. A couple of things. First, you've got to be aware. Please be aware of the issues. Thank you all for being here. Right? Thank you for being here. Thank you for understanding the social context of the populations you're hoping to, to change the dynamics for. If you're doing research in breast cancer, please make sure you have a patient advocate on your team, not as a bystander, an active member of your research team. Get to know the issues. What are they concerned about? What are the things that bother them? What are the things about their treatment? Because I tell you, again, those clinical trials, they didn't have black people in them, a lot of them, right? We don't even know what the side effect profiles are. Are we doing research to understand how people metabolize drugs differently? What their side effect profiles might be? These are things we need to think about. And it's really important to identify what the gaps in care might be in your community. Not just transportation. But even do we think about sexual care for women with breast cancer? That's a huge issue. And it's one that oftentimes gets pushed to the side. I can't tell you. You let a man come with prostate cancer, that's one of the first questions they talk about. So, you know, how's this going to, you know, ha ha, ha ha ha, right? We got a whole entire clinic set up to help them. Just saying. Number two, be aware, number two, Advocacy and policy matters, and I'm not just talking about federal policy, but that's important. I'm going to share a little bit about that. 
state policy. Remember I just talked about Medicaid. That expansion is done on the state level. There are other things. Oral parity law. A lot of our medicines now are taken by mouth. There are still some holdout states that have, there's a loophole where if your medicine is not giving intravenously, you're being charged more money. Yeah, mm. We know tamoxifen can change the outcome for a woman with, with ER positive breast cancer. And yet, if you have a drug and you've got to pay $4,000 a month, you might be like, well, I might, need to, I might have to miss that one, right? Policy matters. But so does policy at the institution you're at, where you're getting your care, where you're a researcher, where you're a scientist. So think about ways that you might have an impact on the care that's being delivered and the research that's being done. That's all policy. And then the third is taking action. And again, this is where, for those of us who are providers, really start to think differently about precision medicine. It really should be personalized medicine. Who's the person sitting in front of you? And for our researchers, please make sure you have a person sitting in front of you. What's your why? Why do you do what you do? It's got to be central to the mission. And if we're saying, oh, I want to find this particular drug that's actually going to revolutionize the way that we treat cancer, please make sure that when you go to clinical trials, you insist that there's inclusive participation in that clinical trial. We can do this. We have the right. We have the capacity to talk to our sponsors in a way that says, inclusive participation matters to me, equity matters to me. This is also important to think about precision public health, and I tell you, this is a whole other thing. But again, we have scientists from all over here. And if we want to talk about disparities, we have to talk about public health. We do not have a public health system in this country. We saw that with COVID, right? And so we're scrambling now to get one back but we still have to think about all the ways that the things that we've been talking about, all the sciences, all the omics, et cetera, how they all relate to the communities we're trying to serve, to the people who are sitting in front of us, so that we really can start to say, I want to make sure that the care I deliver is the right care. If we have African-American women with triple negative breast cancer that have resistant tumors, why the heck are we giving them chemotherapy that's just going to make them weaker and destroy their immune system? What are we doing? Precision medicine. Personalized medicine. Let's start to think differently about the way we do this. My colleagues and I polled over 80 different specialists around the country. This is several years back. And we said, okay, what are some of the biggest gaps in cancer care? What are the ways that we can start to think differently about disparities? And we got all their answers, and we actually convened a group in Washington, D.C. to meet and talk about, like, what are some of the ways that we can overcome the barriers? Because, again, this is not rocket science. This is not the first time we're talking about disparities. The unequal treatment document came out in, what, 2001? All right? And there are, there are things that were talked about there in terms of research and talking about access to care that were there. This framework was published to really look at who are the stakeholders that we need to convene. Again, think about what you might be able to do. How can you participate in this? Who needs to be at the table to, talk, to think differently about equity in the way that we treat cancer? What are the medically underserved populations that we need to be thinking about? Again, not just racial and ethnic groups, but it does go beyond that. This is an important concept, so please, this paper was published in the Journal of Oncology Practice a couple of years ago, first name, last name Winkfield is the first author. Please, please take a look because this framework is important. Guess what the number one thing I said we need to start with? Community engagement. Community engagement. If we want to change the outcomes in terms of the disparities, the lack of equity that we see, we need to understand from the community perspective, well, where are your barriers? Yes, do the science, but we also can simultaneously do the work that's required to say what do communities need so that they can access care in a different way. And so let me just point out a few pieces of legislation I want you all to be aware of and just keep in your mind. There's the Connect for Health Act and the Telehealth Modernization Act. Again, telehealth was a challenge. We, we learned during the pandemic, oh, we can do it, telehealth, and actually patients like it. How about that? You don't have to go and schlep into the doctor's office and take time off from work. You could be sitting there on your little lunch break and be like, hey, doc, how you doing? Right? I actually got to connect with patients and their families in a different way doing telehealth. So these are important things, but then there's a block. People don't want to allow it across states, okay? Diverse Trials Act, increasing clinical trials, and then Safe Step Act. A couple of pieces of legislation is one to make you aware of. But here's one of the things that I am very, very passionate about, and it's advocates and patient voices. On this slide, you will see people that you recognize, right? Robin Roberts, Katie Couric, both diagnosed with breast cancer, but have been using their public platforms to kind of share their work. And then my friend, Monica Bertinoli, who's the new National Cancer Institute director, who, just as she's taken on this brand new job, 
is hit with a breast cancer diagnosis of her own, but using her platform to share. And it's not just people who are this famous, Swag Sheila on Instagram, that's my IG girl, right? Y'all know who I'm you, right? Julia Mawes, right? We have patient advocates who are out there using their platform, whatever that might be, to share. And then the advocacy groups. And so I definitely want to make sure that you all know that there are advocacy groups that are out there who are thinking about you. Our NBC Life that talks about metastatic breast cancer. We all know Susan G. Komen. You saw some of them funding some of the research that's been going on here. Tiger Lily Foundation, which is founded by an African-American woman, as was the Chrysalis Initiative, founded by my girl Jamil Rivers. Um, Living Beyond Breast Cancer has amazing resources, even on sexual health for women, just saying. Really important to make sure these advocacy groups are lifted up to help us. This is not the job of one person, one institution, one group. This is a collective effort to change the face of what we do. So I want to thank you so much for your time and attention. This is in memoriam to my, my friend Lisa Laudico. She was the founder of Our NBC Life, who unfortunately lost her battle to metastatic breast cancer last year. And so I want to thank you for your time and attention, and I look forward to the panel conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Winkfield, um, for bringing us out of the deep science. <laughs> We're going to go from science to advocacy to survivorship. Um, the next speaker is Latoya Williams. She has a bachelor's degree in, in psychology from Grambling State University, an MBA from the University of Phoenix, and she's a national strategic director of health equity community initiatives at the American Cancer Society. And she's going to talk to us about Partners in the Climb, Advancing Health and Equity um, from Community uh, Empowerment. Well, good afternoon, everyone. We are almost there. What an amazing day of education. And boy, do I have some acts to follow. But they have set the stage for me very nicely. So. Thank you very much, and I hope I can keep up that energy of fun. I am Latoya Williams, and I serve as the Strategic Director for Health Equity Community Initiatives at the American Cancer Society. And my talk title is Partners in the Climb, Advancing Health and Equity Through Community Empowerment. I have no financial disclosures. And I have three objectives I will focus on throughout my presentation, and that is to know more about the American Cancer Society, for starters, and to understand the current state of breast cancer in the US and globally, but I promise I will try not to be too scientific with that one, because I am not a doctor. And also ways that we can change the health disparities narrative through community partners to help advance health inequity. So to meet those objectives, I'm going to touch upon each of these topics, starting with learning more about ACS. So I know maybe most of you in this room or all of you in this room know us for our major events um, including the making strides against breast cancer walk but we are so much more than that and i want to reflect on who we are serving 55 million lives and counting and we take this as a pride point as we get the joy of working with each of you in this room and this is a number we can all be proud of but let's be honest, we have a lot of work to do after hearing the presentations today. The American Cancer Society recently updated their vision and mission statement to be inclusive of all communities. Our vision is to end cancer as we know it for everyone. And our mission is to improve the lives of people with cancer and their families through advocacy, research, and patient support to ensure everyone has an opportunity to prevent, detect, treat and survive cancer. This coming May, we are turning 110 years old in this fight against cancer, and we still remain the number one trusted source for cancer information. This is still the largest non-governmental funder of cancer research, and just to highlight a couple of pride points, we've awarded over 30,000 grants since 1946, and we have three programs covering all aspects of cancer research, basic science, preclinical, 
research and clinical research. We have uh, 50 Nobel laureates funded prior to their award, and 70% of cancer NCI directors have received ACS funding. And this is just skimming the surface in all that we do. We currently are funding 634 grants nationwide with an investment of over 434 million in 41 states. Another pride point is our patient programs and services, which I have been a recipient of, unfortunately, but I'm so glad to know that they are there for the community. And we are available free of charge for people living with breast cancer. You can call our hotline 24-7 with trained and empathetic specialists ready to roll up their sleeves and help improve the lives of those reaching out for support and help. We also offer support to reduce access issues like needing a ride to treatment or a cozy place to stay if you or a loved one have to travel far from home for care. But we just want you to all know that we are here for you. Our affiliate partner, ACS CAN Cancer Action Network, is leading grassroots advocacy work to ensure the voices of patients with cancer and survivors are represented in the halls of government. Our nationwide network of volunteers advocate for evidence-based public policy change and take action. And they are not to be messed with. In fact, Dr. Wingfield just recently joined our uh, ACS CAN board, and I, I couldn't be even more delighted. She is going to be a force, and we are so grateful to have you. So as Dr. Copton mentioned earlier, with so much excitement, our annual report on cancer facts and figures. If you know, you know. And if you don't know, you just learned today. And you can download them free of charge at our cancer.org website. And we recently released in early January our 2023 report. And the numbers are still alarming. There are projected to be over 1,958,310 new cases here in the United States of cancer diagnoses and 609,820 cancer deaths. So to learn more, please definitely download the Cancer Facts and Figures report. Now that you know a little bit more about the American Cancer Society, I'm going to transition into the second objective to understand more about breast cancer in the U.S. and Africa. So in addition to the annual Cancer Facts and Figures report, Dr. Copton also mentioned that we have specialized them for the African American community and the Hispanic Latino community. But I also want to point out that we have biannual reports for the breast cancer facts and figures, and this is the most recent for 2022 to 2024. And this can also be downloaded at cancer.org. But these reports provide detailed analysis of breast cancer occurrence and current information on known risk factors, early detection, and treatment. The recent 2023 data estimates that 300,590 new cases and 43,700 estimated deaths in the U.S. Cancer is a disease that can affect anyone, but it doesn't affect everyone equally. This causes health disparities. The causes, rather, of health disparities are complex and include inter interrelated social, economic, cultural, environmental, and health system factors. Underserved populations are disproportionately burdened by cancer and experience greater obstacles to cancer care, as you all heard here in many of the presentations today. White women have the highest incident rates still, followed by black women, but black women still have the highest death rates at 13% more likely to die from cancer, 7% less likely to be diagnosed than white women, and two times as likely to die if over 50. In this slide, breast cancer incident and mortality rates differ by race and ethnicity. Incident rates shown in the light pink bars are similar between black and white in the US. But in contrast, mortality rates shown in the dark pink are highest among black women, 40% higher than those among white women, and 2.5 times higher than among Asian Pacific Islander women. This disparity is due in part to black women being more likely to be diagnosed at a later stage, be diagnosed with aggressive disease such as triple negative breast cancer, 
experience delays in treatment, and have less access to high quality treatment and care. In this slide, the majority of women in the U.S. with breast cancer are diagnosed at localized stage disease when treatment is more likely to be successful and less extensive. Advancements in earlier detection and treatments have led to a decline in breast cancer death rates. However, not all women have benefited equally. As you can see in the light pink and dark pink lines, the slide shows the trend in breast cancer mortality by race and ethnicity. Breast cancer death rates were similar in black women and white women prior to the year 1980, but diverged following the rapid uptake of screen and mammography and advances in treatment. This slide shows treatment patterns for breast cancer by stage at diagnosis and race. Black women are less likely than white women to receive mastectomy for stage three disease, 57% versus 66%, and more likely to receive radiation therapy and or chemotherapy, 9% versus 6%. This slide shows five-year relative survival by stage at diagnosis by race and ethnicity for breast cancers diagnosed during 2012 to 2018, followed through 2019. Black women shown in the light pink bars have the lowest five-year relative survival rate for breast cancer at every stage, aside from the unstaged disease. Now let's look at the global impact, and I hope that Melissa takes me to Africa with her one day. So on this heat map, globally, Africa has some of the lowest breast cancer incident rates. However, incidents have been increasing rapidly in Africa due to the spread of Western lifestyle risk factors, such as increased body weight, delayed and fewer childbirths, and increases in breast cancer screening and awareness. ACS recently published research in 2020 regarding this epidemic of breast cancer in sub-Saharan Africa and found that all registries in the cancer all registries in the African Cancer Registry Network, except for Nairobi, has had increasing rates. And on this heat map, in contrast with low incident rates, Africa has some of the highest breast cancer death rates shown on the map in the darkest colors. This is due to the large reductions in breast cancer mortality in high-income countries due to early detection of cancers through screening and access to high-quality treatment. ACS has conducted research into these breast cancer disparities and found that in sub-Saharan Africa, 50% of breast cancer patients receive inadequate or no cancer treatment due to lack of access. Improving access to screening and care are needed to improve survival for women with breast cancer in sub-Saharan Africa. Advancing health equity. We're almost two thirds of the way through. And I wanna walk you through this third objective and what inspired my talk. These statistics that we're all hearing today are alarming, but what actionable steps can we all do together to change this health disparity narrative? It takes all of us lifting up this work to make an impact. So I'll start by defining health equity, because depending on where you are, health equity is defined differently. But to the American Cancer Society and ACS can, Health equity means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to prevent, find, treat, and survive cancer. So on this slide, and this is one of my favorites, equity versus equality, and we tend to blur the lines on that. On that first line, you'll see equality where everyone has the same size bike. But then equity, on that second line, a bike is customized based on the person's um, unique needs. So equity is not the same as equality. Equality is providing everyone with the same tools and resources. Equity is providing tools and resources based on the needs that allow everyone the opportunity to be as healthy as possible. We are committed to addressing the unequal burden of cancer. And these are my words right here, and not the words of American Cancer Society, but I often say cancer does not discriminate, but policies and practices do. So it is the mission of the American Cancer Society to ensure that communities experiencing the unequal burden 
of cancer are a part of our approach. So why is galvanizing and educating community residents a big deal? I personally say, once again my words, prevention and early detection begins with early awareness and education. I am a 15-year breast cancer survivor, but my journey did not start 15 years ago. I found my first breast lump during the age of 13 while I watched both of my grandmothers pass away from breast cancer just eight months apart. So learning how to check myself early in life and being aware of what I should be doing is what saved my life when we fast forward 17 years later to get misdiagnosed at 29 and accurately diagnosed at 30 with stage three breast cancer. And I was not taken seriously. I knew what to do and that was to go to the doctor when I found that lump, but I was not taken seriously, which led to a later stage diagnosis, unfortunately. According to the CDC, a growing body of evidence shows that people with higher patient activation have better health outcomes. Many studies are showing that patient education is critical to important patient, to improving patient compliance and outcomes because knowledge is power. The more clearly a disease is understood, the more likely it is that an individual will be comfortable with their care, take in charge of their health, and adhere to the necessary regimens. ACS, we understand the assignment, and they have made the investment to develop what we call the Health Equity Ambassador Program. We are educating community residents on the basics of cancer and cancer screening, and that's a strategy that we at the American Cancer Society have prioritized, as we believe we will not reach our mission if we are not intentional and inclusive of every community while actively working toward ending disparities. We are able to achieve this and reach more lives by training health equity ambassadors on evidence-based strategies to deliver cancer prevention and early detection messages and resources in at-risk communities. Two of the key drivers to make this program successful are diverse partnerships and capacity building. The curriculum that we focus on are the screenable cancers for the most part, which is breast, colorectal, prostate. We also train the ambassadors on motivational interviewing and expanding the curriculum to include clinical trials and lung cancer. And the foundation is built off of what we call evidence-based interventions, a subset called client-directed interventions. And to bring this full circle, I learned about evidence-based interventions from Dr. Napolitano, who you heard uh, present earlier. And um, I really took hold of this because I had no idea what those were, and now it just totally makes sense. And to dive a little deeper, what you'll see before you on this slide is a snapshot of the EBIs, evidence-based interventions, as, de as defined by the Community Guide for Preventive Services. The Health Equity Ambassador Program really aligns with the first row highlighted in red, um, and these effects are clearly linked to the activities themselves and not to the outside unrelated events. Client-directed interventions is a subgroup which is most used to educate the communities and can be delivered at both the community level and within health systems. So things like small media, group education, one-on-one -on -one education, we need more of these things in the community to bring early awareness so people um, can reduce their levels of fear. On this slide, um, I'm a very visual person, so when you see these EB EBIs interweaved, uh, starting at the community level. This fosters trusted relationships in the community and encourages constituents to take charge of their health. When you have ambassadors, boots on the ground, educating people so they will have the basic knowledge before they even touch the threshold of a medical center, they can have a healthy dialogue with their providers. They know when they're being told the right things versus the wrong things. They can advocate for themselves better. And, and these are the types of things that we need. It has to be full circle. We are all interweaved into one another. So strategic partnerships are critical to effectively implement client-directed and provider-directed interventions to reduce cancer disparities. Community partnerships. 
the fun stuff here. So our approach to health equity is comprehensive, but we categorize our health equity principles by three Ps, people, places, and partnerships. Through the power of partnerships, we can start to make we can start to make progress toward changing this narrative by leveraging the power of volunteers, partnering with different sectors, and by preventing and addressing unattended consequences. I want to highlight some of the partnerships we have externally at the national level, and we collaborate with community partners that possess existing relationships and or access to populations of focus. Furthermore, the partnerships support the promotion of mutually beneficial goals and measurable objectives. We have a growing portfolio of partners with impactful community organizations that truly help us move the needle and change the narrative, educating one person at a time toward closing the disparity gap of late stage diagnoses and high mortality rates in historically marginalized communities. So I wanna leave you all with three calls to action. Spread the word, promote the work that we're doing here at the American Cancer Society. Two, get involved with your community, become a partner in the climb. And three, get screened. Think about your own communities that you belong to, whether it's your neighborhood, your churches. Do you know if your neighbor is aware of when they should be screened? Think about it that granular and then imagine the masses that still need to be educated. So I thank you for your time today, and I look forward to questions. Uh, thank you, Latoya. Um, definitely looking forward to a discussion about some of the resources you just gave us a highlight of. Um, last but not least, a dynamic patient advocate, survivor, thriver, uh, Desiree A.H. Walker. Um, she's a member of the National Coalition for Cancer Survivors and Cancer Policy and Advocacy Team, a community partner, patient advocate in the Mount Sinai Tisch Cancer Institute, um, Cancer Equity Accelerator and Community Advisory Board, a member of the Multi-Regional Clinical Trial Center of Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard's Health Literacy Resources for Clinical Research and Collaborative Cross-Industry Glossary for Clinical Research Work Group, the President and Board of Directors for Young Survivors Coalition, Community Partner, Patient Advocate in the Mount Sinai. Um, oh, I just said that, sorry. We had a duplication here, but... Um, Definitely, um, Ms. Walker um, and I actually cross paths a lot at professional meetings. So she is a preeminent uh, advocate and professional um, in this space of advocacy, and we look forward to hearing what you have to share with us. Good afternoon. I know there's more than two people here. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I need the energy. And I know the hour is late and I am the last person, but I truly appreciate you being here. I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity um, to test me to see how well I can tell two decades of a story um, in a few minutes. So here goes. Um, I've entitled uh, my talk, Beyond the Pink Ribbon. I think that we, over the years, have heard so much about the pink ribbon, um, but I think that we really need to realize that breast cancer is more than that. Um, I'd like to share, and uh, I thank Dr. Wingfield uh, for her uh, slide that talked about awareness, advocacy, and action. I, I just met her today, so we didn't uh, team up on this. But I just wanted to say that the reason why I added that um, to my slide is because when I was diagnosed, I had very little awareness about breast cancer, um, and I definitely was not aware of all the health inequities that existed. Um, however, when I got that awareness, I often say awareness is great, but you can't just stop there. You need to go a little bit further uh, in terms of action. And so for me, um, I have spent the last two decades, over the last two decades, trying to be that advocate, be that voice uh, for so many that are voiceless um, in this society. And so I act every day that my family tell me that I eat, sleep, and drink advocacy see, but um, I'm still here, so I guess it's healthy to a certain extent. Um, 
I've named my talk um, about reflecting on my breast cancer journey, and I felt that it was important for me to share that I identify as an Afro-Latina Caribbean woman, uh, because oftentimes when we go into spaces, we see people and we think we know who they are, and we really don't. And so it is so important for us to make sure you get to know the people that you say you want to serve and those that you want to lock arms with. So I should have put in a slide that says I have no financial disclosures, but I think that if you know, you heard I'm a patient advocate, I clearly don't. Um, and so, but I just thought because this was important, um, I would just mention that. So I'm just gonna walk through uh, what my journey has been from my initial uh, diagnosis when I had a reoccurrence and how I reimagined my life. Um, I am a quotes person, and so I think that, you know, I think most of us realize, but I would just say it for the record, communication is key to so many things. And so I came across this quote by Stephen Curry, the, uh, Covey rather, um, that says, trust is the glue of life. It is the most essential ingredient in effective communication, because many of us do communicate, but not very effectively, I'll just say. Um, and it's also noted, it's the foundational principle that holds together all relationships. Now, this says, I started my breast cancer journey. Uh, it began here, it's a building. Those of you who may not be native uh, New Yorkers may not know where this is. It is Wall Street. Um, I'd also say this is not a cancer center. The reason why I feel that it's important for me to acknowledge this building is this is where it was diagnosed that I had a problem, or seen that I had a problem which led to a diagnosis. At the time, I worked for Goldman Sachs, which is a premier uh, financial institution. But one of the things that I would accredit them to, besides the gray hair, which you probably can't see because I don't really wear my hair long anymore, um, but they gave me an opportunity as a female staff member to have on-site mammographies. That I feel is why I'm able to stand here before you today. And as I tell my story, you'll understand what the significance of this offering was to me. They offered a mammogram. I thought it was a perk. I said, well, they worked me too hard, so I'm gonna take advantage of every perk they have. Um, and so I did that for three years. What that resulted in is that one day I got a phone call requiring me to come in for additional film. I don't know about you, but when someone calls and tells you they have an appointment for you tomorrow, you know that there's a sense of urgency um, because clearly um, I have had many experiences trying to get an appointment and it's three months off. When I went, they told me after I did my additional film that I should stay and talk to the radiologist. I did. He came and took me into a room and he had my slides up, which is also an important thing. When you do screenings, you have to make sure you either go to the same place so they can compare or you need to bring your film with you. He said to me, Desiree, you know, you've had calcifications, which are very common for the last few years that you've taken this test. However, we now see that it has changed in shape and size, and that is a red flag for us. He said, you need to go and have a biopsy. What I appreciated about that doctor is that he looked at me and he said, do you understand what I am saying? And I said, well, I know what a biopsy is, but I'm gonna be honest, I have no idea where to go get one. And he said, I will have someone from my staff assist you in getting an appointment. Within two weeks, I had an appointment, I had the biopsy done. That radiologist said to me, you need to come back and have your results. I said to her, you seem like a nice woman, but I have a lot of things to do, so I'd rather you just call me as opposed to me having to now come to your office. That may not be what is best for everyone, but that's what worked for me. So in a few days, I had that phone call at my office, I heard the words, you have breast cancer. Now why I say that my employer is significant because I was diagnosed at the age of 38. 
And the guidelines did not say there was cancer screening at that point, but they didn't ask that question, your age, because it was a perk that they offered. And so I like to say that if I had not been there, had I not taken advantage, then I would not have had an early stage diagnosis. I was diagnosed at stage one. Initially, they thought it was DCIS, but when the surgeon went in, she realized it had moved a little further. So I was stage one. I want to say that one of the things that I did, um, I then had to educate myself because when I was diagnosed, it was a time where they were not talking about brown and black women having a high incidence of breast cancer, nor were they talking about young adults having breast cancer either. And so I needed to educate myself because I knew I needed to have a consultation with a breast surgeon, and I wanted to be able to ask questions because I did not want to just go in and have someone tell me what they were going to do and me not be able to address it. So I had my consultations. I made the decision that I wanted to do a lumpectomy, which is a breast conserving surgery, because honestly, I was not in mental preparation for a mastectomy. And because the doctor said to me, or the doctors that I had spoken to said that it was early stage, I said, well, I don't need to be aggressive, i.e. do a mastectomy, so I will do a lumpectomy. But I will also add at that point, we didn't have a scale. And so when the surgery was done and the tissue was sent to the lab and the results came back, the news came back also that there were not clear margins on all sides. So I had two lumpectomies in the end. I just want to also add that that meant my breast was now disfigured. It was not said to me at any point that I was entitled to actually see a plastic surgeon in order to see whether or not they could do anything about the breast now that it was mutilated. The truth of the matter is I spent many years after looking at myself not being very happy and the truth of the matter is, depression is real. I was thankful to be alive, but my body image at the age of 39 was changed forever. I'd also like to just add that, in addition to that, because we've heard about the ER and the PR, and uh, I was positive for hormones, and at the medication that I was given was a monthly injection to reduce the body's production of estrogen but it sent me into medically induced menopause. Many of you, I know we do have men in the audience, but for the women, you know when you're young, you have lots of plans. Menopause is not one of the things you're looking forward to. And so I have to acknowledge that it was a struggle for me. Um, my son, at the time, he would look at me and say, Ma, a flash is coming. And he would jet off to get water and try to fan me. The reality was the heat was real. I don't know that he was helpful, but it caused us to bond, and I'm forever thankful. But that was my reality. So I did radiation therapy. I did hormonal therapy. I like to say that I had a lot of side effects in the experience. I'm not going to get spiritual on you, but I will just say that eight years later, a voice came to me and said, check your breast. And with that, I had known about breast self-exams, which I won't ask the women in this room to raise their hand if they do them, because everyone would start looking down or maybe walking out, and I would like to get through my presentation with an audience. But um, I did a breast self-exam, and I felt a lump. And truthfully, six months prior, I had had a mammogram, and it was negative. I had never seen the lump until that voice said to me, check your breast. And so it was the weekend. I had a relationship with my doctor, so I, I sent her an email to say, hey, can we talk? She didn't answer, but that's important. Self-care is good. So she called me Monday morning and said, what's going on? And I said to her, well, you know, um, I got a voice, told me to check my breast. I have a lump. She said, I don't really think it's cancer. You know, we just had a mammogram. It was all well. I said, I hope you're right. She said, well, come tomorrow. I came in the next day without an appointment, and I had another mammogram done. 
When that mammogram was done, they said, no, we need to do an ultrasound. When that ultrasound was done, they said, we need to do a biopsy. I had three things done. I spent the entire day, but at the end of the day, my surgeon said to me, you're a straight no chaser, so I'm going to tell you this is highly suspicious, but we'll wait for the results. And so eight years later, which is past the five years that they told me that if I made it to five years, I'd be smooth sailing, I was diagnosed with breast cancer again. At that time, I knew I was no longer a candidate for a lumpectomy. I had to do a mastectomy, and I opted to do a bilateral mastectomy because I wanted to reduce my risk of hearing for a third time you have breast cancer. I did consultations, you know, with plastic surgeons, and I said to the plastic surgeon, I'd like to have natural tissue reconstruction. He told me that was not possible. And so he pushed me towards having breast implants. I did not know that I should have looked further. I just really wanted this to be behind me, so I went with his lead. This particular time, I was also positive for her hormones, but I was also positive for her too, which meant that it was an aggressive cancer. And so therefore, I was going to need chemotherapy, and at the time, Herceptin was the only treatment available for her to positive. Because I knew about side effects and late effects, I decided to include integrative um, medicine, and I started doing acupuncture and massage to help me through the process. I just want to add that when I was diagnosed the second time, I had just been laid off. So I did not have uh, medical insurance for the entire time period that I was diagnosed. I decided, although I was unemployed, I would take out COBRA because I was a cancer patient and I thought that it was the best thing to do. But my COBRA ran out before I finished. And so then I had to learn about the system and how to potentially try to get some coverage to be able to finish the treatment for this aggressive cancer. It's been a journey. But I worked with a man once, and I saw this uh, uh, written down in an image, and I thought I would share it and just say that this is what drives me every day. If you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And so all the work that I've done over the last two decades is to make sure that all the problems that I see I'm actually that ripple trying to make a difference because I know I can't change everything by myself, but I can definitely make some changes um, and contribute to the changes that are needed. As you mentioned, or I mentioned, my first picture was talking about where I started. I worked on Wall Street. I haven't been back after my second diagnosis. And then I had that moment what am I going to do with my life now that I've been diagnosed twice and I'm still here? And what is my purpose? And what is my passion? And so I had to reimagine my life after breast cancer. Yes, some will say that this is a complicated slide. There's lots of things on it. But I just want to say that for me, I started out doing outreach in the African-American community because I realized many people did not know what breast cancer is. They may have known the pink ribbon, but that's not enough. And it was important to educate. So the first two organizations, that's what I focused on with them. But when I had my second diagnosis, I realized I better learn the science of breast cancer. And I participated in this Project LEAD, which is a five-day intensive course. Yes, it was mentioned that I am a board member for Young Survival Coalition. I felt it important for me to work with them because I was diagnosed as a young adult. And after I had been in survivorship for many years, I realized that the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship existed. I appreciated their mission. Um, and to Dr. Wingfield's comment about policy, I felt it was important to get involved in cancer policy. My education with Project LEAD led, led me to be a research advocate. I've done reviews for the DOD. I've done reviews for PCORI and many other uh, groups. 
um, but I also have an affiliation with American Association for uh, cancer research, get my words together, um, to say that they have a scientist survivor program that I've participated in for many years um, to strengthen my knowledge, um, but also to be able to give me the opportunity to bring back to my community. And so, um, you know, we've talked about some trials that I've heard, and I would just say that, you know, I realized that it was important to try to get a seat at the table. And so, I actually have the opportunity to serve on the NCI's central IRB, um, and I am that agitator, um, because I am that person that every time I look at a protocol, I say, where are the people that are burdened by the disease? Because they clearly are not in your design. They're not in your recruitment plan. And are we really advancing science if everyone is not involved? I appreciate integrative oncology, and so um, I've lent my talents there. Um, and the last uh, line of this um, are different institutions that I've worked with um, as a research advocate, a patient advocate, um, just trying to make sure that everyone is represented, everyone is heard, and that the patient remains the center of all the work that you're doing and that you make sure that you support the community because without the community's buy-in, you will not be able to do research at the end of the day. But I will say, health inequities, many injustices, it's a lot of work. It's not easy work. It's not always embraced. And so it's important to remember that self-care is important. So rest and self-care are so important. When you take time to replenish your spirit, it allows you to serve others from the overflow. You cannot serve from an empty vessel. So I encourage all of us that are doing this work to remember you need to take care of you so that you are your best self, so that you are actually making a difference at the end of the day. And the last thing that I will give you is something to ponder. Um, Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King has many quotes out there, um, but I stumbled on this one, and I just think that it's really appropriate for this forum. We are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. This is no time for apathy or complacency. This is a time for vigorous and positive action. And so I close with saying, I know we are all here because we have the same interest, but please don't forget that this is now the time where we need to know and we need to contribute to the change we want to see in this country and in this world. Thank you. Um, wow. Um, you know, one of the things I love about Desiree is that whenever she's on a panel, I mean, what, what can I say? She just gives it to you straight. Her, her journey, um, her insight, and her instruction, I just love it. Um, and then I've also had the pleasure of knowing both Dr. Wingfield and LaToya outside of these halls. Um, I think one of the things we all have in common is um, that we are passionate about the work that we do. We may have to have pivoted from what we initially started out on because we were all compelled to do something beyond the boundaries that were in front of us. And even though we're coming at this from a completely different perspective, all of us um, have dedicated our, our lives um, to making sure that we 
address this issue um, of breast cancer disparities in every, um, in every aspect. So now is our time for panel discussion. We are running a little behind. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to just put forward to our panelists, and, and um, please, if you have a question for anyone, go ahead and raise your hand so we can bring the mic to you. Um, each of you, as I mentioned, spoke about um, your passion from a perspective of either your own personal experience or witnessing things around you that you felt needed to be changed. And what I would like each of you to try to articulate right now is, you know, the sustainability of the work that you've done. Um, you know, we each kind of come to the table with a lack of resources from one aspect or another. Can you speak to how you have tried to make your work sustainable? Thank you for the question. Um, I believe sustainability is key in anything we do. One of the things when I was talking with the communities, again, I, I believe very much that community engagement has to be first and foremost in the way that we approach some of these issues, is they would often say, well, I don't, why should I work with such and such institution? They always come in and do their research and then leave, right? The helicopter research, where you, you want something, you show up in the community. And from my perspective, every single health system needs to be present just because it's the right thing to do. Not because you want anything, not because you, you know, you're going to get something, they're going to enroll in the clinical trial. Maybe they will, but maybe it's not going to be at your institution, right? So some of the things that I try to do is actually build that sustainability into the work that I'm doing. I always make sure we have patient advocates involved in all sorts of aspects of the work we do. When I was associate director of the Cancer Center, we pulled together a group of advocates and we started training them to the advocates for research and medicine. And now they can then train the next generation, right? So part of it is creating this, this pipeline, if you will, of individuals who understand the need and the importance of these issues um, so that really you can make sure that the work goes beyond you. Uh, it is important to have funding. Right? And I happened to be at a cancer center. I was like, I think it's important for us to have patient navigation. They're like, yeah, no, we're not going to fund that. So I went out and got grants. And in addition to getting those grants, I found a philanthropic group to actually provide funding. So now at that hospital, even though I'm no longer there, they have an endowment in perpetuity, right? So funding is key too. Identifying those key partners and strategizing on how to work with them. We worked very much with ACS and, and, um, when it came to our transportation. It kind of dipped during the pandemic, which is reasonable, right? There's volunteers. But finding the community partners who can help join in is a really important part of sustainable planning when it comes to thinking about the issues related to health disparities. And I'll add in from starting with the personal perspective, I like to think that I was anointed to do this work. Not a day of my life did I think I would be diagnosed with breast cancer at an early age. Um, I was working in the field of engineering prior to this, but cancer changed my life so much that I found mission, passion, and now have God liberated my mind to do this work and how I found the American Cancer Society. And I strongly believe follow the data and if you want to sustain. If you cannot measure it, you cannot manage it. And when I look at the data and how alarming it is, especially for people of color, it just fuels my passion even more to roll up my sleeves and be innovative and creative and intentional on how we can change this narrative. So I'd say be intentional in all that you do and really have a passion because Anyone in this room, God forbid, can hear those words one day, and you don't want to be on the opposite side of the curveball of not knowing what to do. So telling my story, I don't do it in vain. I do it because it's necessary. I feel like something I say might change or motivate someone to take action, move from awareness into action. So sustainability is key, and just keep going out there, rolling up your sleeves and doing the work. The only thing that I would say, um Oftentimes, people do not acknowledge their privilege, and I feel that those that are privileged should take these opportunities in order to support um, health equity um, and the work that needs to be done. Um, because at the end of the day, the sad reality, you will know someone who has been diagnosed. And it's often unfortunate when you do, that's the time that you actually care about something, and I think it's something that should happen beforehand. And the only thing that I would say in terms of a personal experience, for me, um, I tell people that the work that I've been doing, it's not so that I could be the equivalent to Jeff Bezos, 
but it's to make sure that I know that I am helping to change lives and uh, anything that I am doing, it may be able to support someone in getting diagnosed earlier when there are more opportunities for treatment uh, at the end of the day. And so for me, I will get involved in many things even if there is not a offering of financial compensation um, and be just because I want to make sure the right voices are part of the conversation. Absolutely. And even if I answer that question, I think um, it touches upon each of what you, what each of you have said is that a lot of the work that I do, I, might, I try to make sure it's a part of capacity building, particularly when we're in Africa. Um, whenever we go, there's someone, one of the students, who's just walking down the hall and is curious, you know, what are you doing? Come on in, put on some gloves, let me show you. And then that becomes an opportunity to have someone enter the field, into the research. That then gives me someone on the ground at a distant site to, to link to, to provide resources for. So, you know, my goal of sustainability kind of looks like training expanding the capacity, making people aware of the work that we do and the importance of the work that we do. And then, you know, as you mentioned, Desiree, um, identifying people who have deep pockets and opportunities who, you know, can be transformative in, in the work that we're trying to do. Um, any questions so far from any of the panelists? Yeah. So today we've heard um, from so many uh, researchers and, and you know, skilled practitioners about you know, different findings and, and the different types of cancers and subtypes. And, you know, and one thing I'm hearing, especially from patient advocates, is that when you're presented with a diagnosis of cancer, you know, in terms of what type of treatment you'll actually get and what type of choices that you'll be presented? I mean, is that entirely up to you? Is that entirely up to your oncologist slash treater? <laughs> I mean, who's accountable for determining what would be the best standard of care for your, yourself as an individual, especially as a black woman? Um, is, it, is it the institution who decides this? Like, does it depend on where you go for treatment? Because especially for our two patient advocates here, um, what I heard was, you know, I was presented with possible possibility of surgery, different types of surgery, from mastectomy to lipectomy. First off, you know, whether you got uh, chemo before or after surgery, like who who is best accountable for determining mm -hmm. what choice do do you make when you're presented with this, especially for the first time? So that's a very good question, and let me just, I don't know if you saw my last slide, but my colleagues and I have a podcast called Three Black Docs. It's two medical oncologists and myself as a radiation oncologist, and we deal with those issues of empowerment and advocacy from a patient perspective. When you walk in, what do you do? Do know that there are toolkits that are out there, right, that can help you think about what are the, what are the kind of different types of treatments or what are the questions I need to ask my doctor? Because frankly, it's your body. You're the captain of the ship. But I think it's really important to know what the options are. I can't tell you how many women I've, I've had who say, well, I didn't even know anything about radiation. I was told that if I have a mastectomy that I won't need radiation. I'm like, did you talk to a radiation oncologist? Because that really depends on what stage you are, right? Whether or not radiation therapy is something that really um, is going to be recommended, depending on if you have lymph nodes involved, for example. So I think it's really important to ask a series of questions. What type of disease do I have? What stage you know, do I have? And there's toolkits that can help walk you through. The decision is ultimately up to you, but here's the deal. We want to make sure you have people around you who respect who you are and who are listening Absolutely. to what it is that is important to you. Because I can tell you, like, if, if somebody just says, you know, well, I'm not really interested in cosmesis, I talk about this all the time, even from a radiation perspective, black women actually oftentimes will get what's called hyperpigmentation. But they're not talked about. That's, they're not told that because that's not one of the side effects that's listed in the radiation journals. You know why? Because all the stuff has been for white women. But for my black patients, I'm like, okay, let's talk about this. Here's, here's the options. If you have early stage breast cancer, you can do radiation, but you might have some long-term side effects. Let's talk about some of those things, right? So part of it is just making sure you have a team of people around you, a team of doctors that can actually help you understand what the options are that are available to you, okay? 
Obviously, if you have early stage cancer, you have a little bit more time. You have more advanced stage cancer, you have to make a decision more quickly. Um, but this is really important for you to have at least a list of questions to ask your doctor before you make that decision alongside your doctors. That's a wonderful response. And I think one of the things that this points out is the fact that we need to have awareness of the fact that you do need to have a list of questions and yeah. maybe you don't know that walk into your doctor's mm -hmm. office. Correct. And of course there's a standard of care, right, that your clinician is supposed to follow. Mm -hmm. But as you mentioned, what is best for me or my lifestyle or, you know, my financial situation, you know, um, it, do either of you also want to, you know, chime in? Yeah, I would just, um, you know, weigh in um, that it's important for you to educate yourself. I think a lot of times, you know, we tend to be a reactionary society um, and we wait till things happen before we learn. Mm -hmm. And so I would just, you know, I encourage everyone, you know, to understand something about the various diseases that our community, you know, is burdened by um, because it's important for you to know what questions to ask. I will tell you, if you don't ask pointed questions, mm -hmm. oftentimes doctors don't give you the big picture. They don't tell you all the granular details which would impact your decision. And so I definitely would say it is your decision. There is standard of care, yes, but it is your decision. You need to make sure that what is going to happen is what's going to work best for you in the end. I had a friend um, that was being offered certain tr chemotherapy that would have potentially put them at risk for neuropathy, and they were a pianist. Mm -hmm. They did not want to then take that particular drug, mm -hmm. because there were thankfully others, mm -hmm. because it would be important for them to still be able to play the piano. And so it's to that extent why you need to understand what is being offered, because you can't turn back. They can stop a treatment, but the damage that might have already occurred, you can't reverse it in many instances. So I encourage people to make sure that they understand. And I will say, make sure that you get your information from credited sources, mm -hmm. um, because Dr. Google, has a lot of crazy on it, um, you know, at the end of the day. And so it's important to acknowledge that. And let me just add one more thing. I can't tell you how many times I'm sitting there with a patient and they hear the C word and then all of a sudden they glaze over. Mm -hmm. Please bring somebody with you. Yeah. Okay? Bring a, a friend, trusted family member, whatever. I know it's hard because sometimes we're like, well, I don't want to burden people. No, no. You've got to bring somebody with you because there's going to be so much information coming at you that sometimes you just need somebody who can scribe for you, who's there to support you, to hold your hand, and maybe to remember some of those questions that you might forget. So that's one of those things. So I love that. Get educated before there's a cancer diagnosis, right? And then make sure you have somebody with you. Thank you. I think Dr. Matello Rooney is going to make some closing comments, or we have a couple more questions, though. Um, we are a little over time. Do we have a couple of minutes to take a few questions? So, so real quick, um, awesome presentations, awesome presentations. Two quick questions. First question is, does, um, does some triple negative, um, um, triple negative breast cancers um, um, develop into quadruple, or is that two separate different cancers? That's one question. And then the second question, real quick, um, just curious, um, how would you recommend um, the males in your life, the brothers in your life, support um, women who are dealing with, sisters who are dealing with breast cancer? I'm just curious to hear that side. So the de de development from triple to quadruple, and how would you recommend brothers to develop and to um, support sisters who are dealing with breast cancer? Um, that's a great question. I think, you know, for longitudinal information about quadruple negative breast cancer, we would have to have more information about how the, you know, clonality of the tumor is developed. We don't have that information yet. But I will say that all of these different subtypes are really on a spectrum, right? So any given tumor is not going to be completely 100% you know, one thing or another. For instance, ER positivity is on a spectrum of percentage of, you know, positive cells. Same with ER status. So um, we don't yet know in terms of, like, whether it evolves into an AR negative um, state, but um, all tumors have some level of heterogeneity. Um, for what brother should do, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pitch that over to our, our patient advocates and, and thrivers. So, oh, go ahead, you go first. 
I'd say I was fortunate enough to have my father as that brother in my life during my diagnosis, but he had a complete meltdown. And I was so thankful, and I'm gonna plug ACS because talk about a place of resources and information. They have information for caregivers on how to be a friend to someone with cancer. And they were able to coach him on how to deal with me mm. and my meltdowns, um, but it made him a stronger person. And I noticed he was doing things for me that he'd never done before, including getting me a dog, but that's <laughs> another situation. But things like, just making sure that I, I have the right foods to eat. Um, being empathetic when I have my meltdowns to just listen and be that listening ear. Give me a hug when you know I need it. Um, we're not asking for a lot because there's nothing really you can do, but be supportive. So I recommend to all men to be patient and empathetic and um, try to be proactive in what you think your loved one need. I think culturally, especially when we get bad news, we tend to be an introverted people, you know, like we get bad news and we kind of close ourselves off to handle whatever it is we're going through. In this situation, like what you've heard in this room, if you weren't in the room and you didn't know it before now, you still don't know it. You don't know that there's information that you don't have. You don't know that there are resources that you can tap into. We need to, the first in, in, in inclination should be open up and look for support support for our caregivers as well in order to be armed with those questions that we need to ask in order to know what all the options are. And there is a wealth of information. If you, if you simply follow any of these women on Twitter, <laughs> I think that you would, you would you know, have a world of information flowing into your life to really know, you know what all of your options are and what all of the um, support um, that's available for you. And I learned a ton today, even about American Cancer Society. And we're going to take this can other I, can question. Can I just say one, one thing yeah, uh, to sure. the gentleman? Um, you know, I think that it's important to acknowledge that men have been taught that they are protectors. Um, but it's also important to acknowledge when a loved one gets diagnosed that you can't protect them in this instant. But what you can do is educate yourself to understand what the journey could look like, to have that knowledge to support them from that perspective, but also to acknowledge your own vulnerability and seek help um, at the end of the day. Because without you being able to support them, the journey is that much more difficult because now they're worrying about how you're doing as opposed to what they're going through. I think she needs to write a book that's called Educate Yourself. Yeah. Um, for it. I, I hear I, someone on the mic, but I don't know who it is. So. I have the mic. I, I, I'm just um, curious on the role of the insurance um, industry or those sectors, whether it has to do with um, delay in treatment or choice of treatment for the, the cancer patients in this inequities. Uh, That's a three-day conference, right. <laughs> um, but let me just say this. They're one of the stakeholders that needs to be at the table for these conversations because I tell you, as a radiation oncologist, when I have to do a prior authorization to treat a woman with breast cancer, it's ridiculous, right? They have breast cancer, they need radiation therapy. I shouldn't have to do prior authorization. That was coming up over and over again. The stress it puts on the patient, because they get a note saying that this is not going to be covered, it, it causes mistrust between the patient and the provider, because the patient's like, well, I thought you said this is what I need, and my insurance company's saying not. There are major issues. Like I said, it's a three-day conference. It's a major <laughs> issue. We just need to get people insured. That's step one. <laughs> Let's mm. get them insured. But we need to make sure that they're not underinsured, and that's a whole other issue in, in the United States, at yes. least. Other countries, it's different. Yeah. Last question. I really have to stand up because I'm excited. <laughs> okay. So I can't say. <laughs> I have to, please bear with me, I have to introduce myself. I work with the New York City Commission on Human Rights. So mm -hmm. we go out and we educate personnel so what their rights are. And I'm saying that because knowing that cancer is an unseen disability, and when we go out and you talk to persons and they are coming to you and they say, well, you know, I lost my job because, you know, I mean, not just on cancer, some persons have diabetes and different you know, different um, health, health issues, um, but they, because they don't have insurance, that they cannot get the, the treatment that's needed. And also persons now have to leave their jobs and they have to go to the doctor several times a week for treatment, and then they, um, they, they, they lose their jobs or they are laid off or something. 
So when you hear, you go out there in the community and you're hearing, you know, those type of issues persons are having, I'm also the chair at my community board and the chair for health and social services. So I'm pushing health and then you get me excited <laughs> and I'm sitting there so and I'm hearing you talking about um, community advocate and persons out there and I'm shouting to you, use me, I'm open <laughs> because I am so, I am not a doctor, I don't have anything on when my background is not health, but I am so, um, pumped up when it comes to educating the community, letting them know. And when it comes to ACS, I think usually when um, Breast Cancer Month comes, that's the time we just see all pumping in the community and we're seeing all those advertisements, but we need some more action. We need to see more of you in the community, right. some yeah. a van in the community mm -hmm. or whatever it is, partner with the community boards, you know, and just let put it, I'm here, you, I can give you my card. Because I'm gonna, I will search for you guys if you don't con connect with me. Because I live 10 minutes away from here, okay? okay? And then we're in a community where you find persons, we, they have to have a really bad experience when it comes to they have to go to the doctors. They feel a little pain, they, they don't go until it's too late. And we really need to educate our young people. We really need to educate the youth. And I, I, I really want to connect with you because I'm having a mental health forum in May. And after that, I, I, I need to connect with you so we can have a, a forum when it comes to best, breast cancer in the community. And my sister here, I need to connect with you because I want you to use me. <laughs> Thank you. Let me just say, you, you mentioned, you brought up one thing that was really important. Insurance doesn't mean you have access. Right. Insurance does not mean you have access to care. And let me tell you something. When I was in Boston, when we had universal coverage, we had Romney care before there was Obamacare. We had less than 4% uninsured rate. People still did not feel they were welcome into certain right. places. So you bring up a really important point, and I really am so excited that you're pumped up, because we mm. will use you. And I think it's important to make sure that we educate people about the fact that they can advocate for themselves and be empowered. That's really powerful. Thank you. Yes, from genetics to policy, survivorship, education, advocacy, Wonderful, wonderful panel. Thank you so much for joining us and staying around.